Hospital Portless Pride and Dignity, stop the New World Order. Welcome to her Pango TV. Happy World Disclosure Day, it's the 8th of July. I'm uh, just leaving Oxford. We're stuck in a traffic jam at the moment, as you can see. But I will hopefully be leaving Oxford soon. I'm here with my good friend and comrade, my spade brother, Colin hello, Wolford. Hello, hello. You'll yeah. recognise him. One time nice see. And yeah, we are heading off, Colin. We're going off. Where heading are we going? To um, the wilds of Wiltshire, that is Devizes and for the Bases Conference, which begins tomorrow morning, bright and early, um, a few of our friends are going, so we'll be looking at going to, to the barge maybe for a swift half later yeah, on, and definitely. then back to Miles's, I think. So, um, this lady out, and um, so yeah, we'll. Um, have a good time, I think. I mean, what's what could go wrong, you know? Oh, uh, fingers crossed. <laughs> who knows? No, Famous I mean, last words. I mean, the good thing about this is obviously you're meeting up with like minded people who are an interest in the subject, and so yeah, everyone's pretty much on the same him sheep, so to speak. And um, mm. you know, I think it's I think it's the first popular conference, isn't it? Since I think you were saying your I mean, you went to the whole one, was that the, the last one? That For me, was the tree, yeah. It was the Phoenix conference when I was supposed to talk um, in. February 2020. Uh, same month. Uh, yeah. Was that Phoenix? No, it was Laughlin. Sorry, that was Laughlin. Yeah. So I did sort of kind of do it. But that was my last proper conference. So um, yeah, Kerry Cassidy was supposed to do one last week, which had now been pushed back to mm. mid, mid July. Is it, it is uh, the, the last week. It's, I think it's, it's evening. It's two evening events in um, yeah. late July. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but um, yeah, this will be good fun. Um, Lots going on, you know. They've got crop circles appearing again. Yeah, yeah. One, one appeared in Avebury not uh, a couple of days ago, which looked fantastic. Cool. And um, yeah, got three days of fun. And um, I must admit, I'm not, I'm not sure of the latest schedule. What Miles is on the late on the no. list, but we'll, we'll find that out, I'm no doubt. And it'll, you know, as, as you were saying, <laughs> and it's usually I, I think Matthew Williams, who was going to help out on the tech side of things, has not been too well. He's got a oh, few dear. troubles with. Um, He's probably caught some infection and he's probably caught something yeah. problems. Oh dear. So I'm not sure. So um, Miles might be even more sort of hot-headed as than ever because oh. um, he, you know, he he's, can, be, can be quite stressful because he's literally doing it all yeah. on his own. And you know, we have to sort of give a lot of thanks to Miles for being able to put on a oh, like this yeah. because you know there's not much going on, and he's even doing it before the lockdown is officially. Ends because I think was it what is it next Monday? Is it's it? ending on the nineteenth, which yeah, is so um, what is that next? Not I don't know when that is. No. But no, I mean, before. yeah. Deepest respect to Miles for what he's done, M Matthew. I mean, I'm guessing Matthew picked something up on one of his herb urbex things. Well, things. So he probably good. broke into some laboratory and picked up some alien virus. Yeah, he did a little video yesterday. And he's saying that well, hopefully he would be up to date doing some urbex stuff, but um, he's, you know, he hasn't been too great. Um, some sort of infection, and um, I think that's. When it's you know I don't know it's a bit graphic but uh, yeah it doesn't, doesn't sound he did great. a video about it or he did a video yeah. about it doesn't mind people talking about it but I mean I'll show you like I'll show you guys at home the um, the little blurb and what what Miles has got planned um, because it's looking pretty good um, we we've got a conference as Colin said it's a, Miles is really pushing the boat out this is a three day conference Friday Saturday Sunday he's really stretching. Oh. Steve sat now was just interrupted <laughs> but yeah we've got. Um, but that's uh, then what we're going to do that then is uh, we're going to I'm sp I'm speaking on the Saturday but we on the Friday it's a full day and uh, Saturday and all Sunday um, there's 50 miles originally 50 seats you managed to get 10 more I believe you sold out I think so which is brilliant I was, I was, yeah I was um, looking on there I think one person had to return it because they couldn't make it or whatever so there might just be one available it's, it's worth checking if you can still make it I mean I don't know when this video is it's probably already be done it'll be done it'll be done dusted so yeah, but, it's done, but. Um, yeah, let's hope that, you know, that's a good mm. thing, isn't it? I mean, people crying out. I, I, you know, it's what I thought would happen. People, there should be an even bigger interest in these things because uh, what happened with the lockdown, basically. Well, that's going to, like, firstly, there's this revenge tourism thing you've heard. Uh, there, I think there's a kind of woo-woo equivalent of that, What's which is this. Sorry, it's where people people go off, people really, because the lockdown's ending, people right. splash out on massive ah, holidays, just kind of get their own okay. back on fate and the government ah, and all these themselves. other things. Yeah. Oh, okay. But yeah, okay. you, you, there may still be some tickets available, so if anyone is remote viewing me in the right now at this moment as I'm recording, get your ass to Honey Street, as Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. would say. 
Yeah, get your ass to Wiltshire. Uh, you can get yourself to Wiltshire and come along to this brilliant event. And I tell you, Miles, Miles' conferences are so good, and it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, along with me, there's also some other interesting speakers. Um, Edmund Marriage is going to be speaking, Maria Wheatley. Yeah. Um, who's some, Tony Topping's in a double bill, I think. Ah, so it's Tony Topping's going to be there. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be. I've already interviewed him about that book, and he's coming. And it's oh, going to be okay. quite a. It's going to be quite revelatory. He's going to go into some areas which he hasn't talked about before, um, and it's going to be quite something. I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, we've. Um, it's, it's also another thing I should point out is that this is quite an auspicious sort of serendipitous and other kind of weird synonyms that make me sound sophisticated moment because um, because the UFO situation has changed a lot in the last 12 months um, and it's, of course it's been a quiet as I said it's been quiet this is the first conference it's the first real, real UFO Paracon conference since Rawcon in February like Colin was saying yeah. February last year if, if you watch regularly you'll know that I haven't been to a conference since February last year I've done like some zoom calls and things but it's not the same as actually being there. It's not the same. Of course not. Mm. But Colin, uh, you know, went to the ones in the United States. I've yeah, I I one in Hull. I think contact in the desert did there's online, but apparently that went really badly wrong. I, I, I didn't sign up for it, but I think there's a lot of glitches and a lot of. Uh, I think a lot of it was pre-recorded. So yeah, you, basically you can't you can't beat going to a conference. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, not being able to get to America, you know, it's, it's a good alternative to, to watch stuff online if you know if you want to. I mean, yeah. it's certainly a lot cheaper. But yeah, you can't beat going going to places. Obviously, not not, not necessarily America, but just you know, just coming to the UK, especially when it's summertime. And, oh, um, yeah. I mean, there's so much to see there as well. You can go to see all the sacred sites. You might see a crop circle. Yeah. And, Lots to do, really. Lots, lots, you know, lots to drink, lots to eat. Oh, go to the pub pub, <laughs> have some alien abduction yeah. ale, things like that, and, uh, which is one of their specialities at the Honey Street Brewery. Also, um, I should point out that Contact in the Desert did they had an online event, which I thought was a bit pricey for an online yeah. event. Um, well, I've also, I've also, I also think they're a bit dodgy because you know they, what happened with Jordan Sather. You know, the, yeah, um, he's quite so. Yeah, I mean, he's a controversial character, I know. Wow. Uh, but he had he did a talk about QAnon and stuff like that, and they and they uh, well, for some reason they lost the recording. Do you remember? Yeah, I think they put him on in the first thing in the morning, like a ridiculous time, like eight o'clock when who's like you know, and um, I think it was one of the smaller rooms, and apparently people queuing outside, and mm. you know, I got a lot of respect for Jordan. Oh, he's I like done a lot stuff, of yeah. good stuff, and um, yeah, that's kind of sad, really. I mean, people. I'm a bit wary about some connections like Gaia has and stuff like that and um, you know there's a few stories going around I think Emery Smith's been you know he's sort of stories about him about kiss and tell story I was, I was watching some video oh, well, and uh, he's another controversial character whether you believe him or anything um, yeah, I don't know about these characters. Sometimes you think, oh, are they under the victim? Are they some? I don't know whether these people are getting these memories from, or whether they're multiple personalities, or this this, this information. It's it's a it's a tough one in the truth, you know, when you're in this subject because yeah. you're going to have to try and use your bullshit detector and read as much as you can about the subject, make up your own mind about stuff, and. Um, yeah, it's not. It's, it's it's certainly not easy to know what's actually going on. All you can do is just listen, and if it resonates, you know, take it on board. You don't have to sort of nail your colours to the mast and say this is true. And that. you mean you can change your mind about things. It's not a crime to say that you thought something might be something to it, and later, you know, that's all about changing your mind about yeah. things because it's such a controversial subject that there will be people who will try and convince you that you know they're telling the truth that they know what's going on you know there's a lot about that you know there's a lot of characters you know since the lock, lockdown and covid have claimed that you know that we're heading for some sort of quantum financial system and you know trump's gonna i mean you know all these stories that you can just you can pull out any story about things I think that's maybe what your talks were a bit about, maybe a bit about the future, be, yep. trying to predict what's going to happen what in yeah. the next few months, I mean, if not year, years, mm -hmm. you know. So that's it. Yeah, it's it's a tricky. It's a it's one of these situations we are kind of like on a knife edge. The predictions are difficult, but 
obviously we finally got out of Oxford anyway, that's something. We're, yeah, we have finally the sun, the sun left now, Oxford. It's, good, it's yeah. nice weather, yeah, you see it's nice it's, weather out there. July the 7th, is it today? Yeah, it's July the 8th, the World yet? Disclosure Day. Is it? Oh, is World eight? Disclosure Day today, the 8th, oh, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, happy World Disclosure Day, oh, I said Happy World Disclosure Day, didn't I? Yeah, but um, I mean, World Disclosure Day was assigned oh. by the Paradigm Research Group in 2010. So this is the 11th World Disclosure Day. Now, it is, it's called World Disclosure Day because it is, it is July the 8th that ge the General Raimi empties Roswell oh, saucer okay. cover-up okay. story oh, about the weather balloon okay. was published in the Roswell Daily Record. Very good, um, very good. Yeah, if you read my Roswell Rising, a novel of disclosure, you know, it tells the story of the man who wrote that particular article. But, um, the, uh, it's imaginary, of course. I'm just guessing, but uh, the whole uh, what's the idea is with white. It'll be switched whichever day disclosure happens on. The World Disclosure Day will be switched to that day, but until then, it's going to be celebrated on July the 8th. So maybe this is the last year we'll be celebrating on July the 8th. I don't know, but interesting. Yeah, but it's it's, it's funny. Like I, I put up an article on a Panama Voice last night before I went to bed, just after midnight. Uh, getting there quickly. Uh, I mentioned the that Dr. Stephen Greer has released a new documentary just a couple of months after the last one, and it's it's called a yeah, the cosmic, cosmic hoax, an expose. Yeah. Did you see that? I did actually. I watched it a couple of days. What do you think uh, of that then? I mean, well, it's very controversial. If, if only because he does attack a few people in a which you know normally not something you'd normally would do on a UFO documentary. Yeah. So I mean, it could be seen as refreshing or quite. Um, what would the word be that's rather disrespectful you could say about certain people depending on what you view of these people because even if you're attacking the likes of Elizondo and, and um, what's his name uh, Melon Chris Melon, Melon yeah. yeah and um, Leslie Keane I think it was also a new one on there that I haven't heard a type before yeah. um, obviously Stephen thinks he's you know he's been there since you know he's been there to be fair since a lot of people you know early 90s late 80s even um, yeah, so he does know his stuff um, he does he's come you know he's done, done stuff involving crop circles I, I value his work on the Disclosure Project 2001 which you know still you know will be remembered in history as a major turning point in some ways as far as getting that but you know you, like all these characters you, you never quite I, you, I can't align myself totally with him just because I I never bought into the total there was you know no abductions um, no um, you know that the, the aliens are all going to be friendly yeah, I mean this is clearly I mean that just seems I mean I, I can understand his good wishes that yeah I mean that there is good out there and it is a positive generally a positive thing but it'd be not even the extreme in a universe <laughs> and <laughs> but just to suggest that I mean, we clearly know that there is at best creatures that are neutral um, looking at things like you know it doesn't mean cattle mutilations are because of beings themselves are, 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 are oh, yeah, yeah. because it could be for a whole manner of reasons you know I mean we would attack humans for, you know, have eating meat or whatever. You know, you can go into all these different views of good and evil and what's, um, you know, right and wrong. But I, yeah, I, I don't quite resonate with his current stance. And then even for Rick Doty to come out and say he, he felt a bit misrepresented in the little clip that he had, I think oh. I saw him put a comment on. It's got to be rather <laughs> extreme for Rich for Richard Doty to feel misrepresented. He's yeah. got a little bit of extreme I because think, he was interviewed now, wasn't he? And it was well, like, yeah, the other interesting thing was he. he I was trying to get um, Jack Valet to release a document, which which did, and I, I had read the, the Jack Valet's book, um, which is basically his diaries for 1999 and it was implying that um, it's quite well known that the claim is that there were some of the abductions uh, were staged in Brazil, I believe it was, and there were apparently some documents available to that, and for whatever reason. Um, this wasn't released by Jack Valet to Stephen Gris. I don't know if fallen out or they, I don't know of a technicality why that document wasn't on there. I'm not even sure if anyone's actually seen this document, but uh, so I'm not saying, so again, I'm just to make a point, I, I, I think you know, there are staged abductions. I do believe in military abductions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but to label everything 
if, as every abduction has been a uh, government or military abduction, it seems preposterous. As, it's very, it is, yes. <laughs> it is preposterous. And, um, He's not making any friends. I mean, even if you don't get on with people, you don't sort of slag them off in a documentary. I mean, he did charge money for this documentary, to be fair to him. Mm. But still, it's... I mean, that's going to ruffle a few feathers there. And I'm not quite sure... No, it will. ...how people it will. view him, you know. Um, well, I mean, from my point of view, I mean, I... It was released straight onto onto public media without charge in one go, which is unusual for Greer. But he, uh, yeah, Greer has is someone I always watch all his in his new videos with enormous interest. But I always have mixed feelings about them. This particular one is is his worst one ever, definitely. Um, he, I don't, I'm not saying like we when uh, Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, uh, Tom DeLonge, and these other people, the TTSA or ex TTSA. If they come out and say something, I'm not saying we should just hang on every word. I'm not saying oh, that. Yeah, exactly. But the, the shill shaming, mind, yeah. the shill shaming which Greer hurled at them is completely unfounded. And it's, and that's before it gets really bad and he starts attacking Leslie Kane. Uh, she, she is, she's been in the business almost as long as he has. And a lot of what we know, a lot of what, what the background to this new ufology comes from her. And it's because of her and Ralph Blumenthal's articles that we know what we do. It's her own research and the very, very dedicated research she did, um, which has really, really enlightened us in the last couple of decades as what's happening. And, and Greer has benefited from this himself. And to say, well, she must be, you know, what, I don't remember his exact word. She must got to be a shill because she, she, she believes that it's a threat. Well, you see, the thing about it is, when... When people say the word threat, right? if you're a military strategist, you say yeah. the word threat. It doesn't mean this is something you've got to shoot at immediately, just like that, no. Yeah. It means yeah. something that's, that's an unknown, which, into yeah, which, might, which might result in enemy action, we don't know. That's all it means. And of course, by that definition, UAPs are a threat. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with saying it. doesn't mean they're gonna get, we should exactly. shoot at them. And I'm on my guard against the, what Carol Rosin said. Um, I've said this on previous videos. I am aware of the possibility that that is what's being done. I, I, at the same time, I'm not going to take an ex look, his very, very cynical line because then we miss out on an opportunity. And I think, really, I can't help wondering if he's just pissed off because disclosure is not all about him. He wants yeah. it to be all about him. He wants to be able to flex his muscles on TV and spread his legs and flash his balls, right, behind his, behind his tight jeans. And that's what he's used to. And now suddenly, it's all out of it. Now it's suddenly he's just one of many, many people in this business doing their thing. And he sees this, so he looks at Leslie Kang, looks at Lou Elizondo, he sees what they're doing, what they're achieving, and he thinks it's a threat to his ego. I'm sorry if I sound cynical there, but that's what I think I mean, he's doing. It could be. I mean, it could be that would seem the most obvious answer. But, um, I mean, of course, you can't rule out that he himself might be, you know, have a hand to hand being handled by, you know, and being told yeah, to right. stay stuff. Um, you know, a lot of people, people were quite close to him died, I think, during, you know, over the years and stuff. Yeah. And um, he lost there's all sorts of ways that they can literally, I don't know, you know, they can sort of program you to, to accept, you know, they might, he, might, might, he might have been given some sort of program himself to sort of come on board a particular viewpoint so we just can't you know rule it out and yeah. uh, but uh, I didn't I didn't kind of go along with what you say Ben but it does speak a bit you know the ego type thing and yeah. um and this, I don't want to have a, be too hard on him. I mean, oh, see, he's been doing this for like the best part of 30 years and he's got every right to be proud of what he's achieved and he has. And he was very influential on me. He really was. Oh, in, yeah. in, the two, in the 2000s when I was getting into exit politics, I was listening to all his interviews and stuff like this. But then I, I realised that, that there is something a bit weird about him. For example, I met a guy, uh, I met a guy at Leeds. I think you were there actually in the Leeds ex-politics, a guy from the Netherlands ex-politics, Netherlands, he was, he was, he said, oh, he acted as Greer's bodyguard. Now, <laughs> Greer, Greer does walk around, he has bodyguards with him. Now, Richard Dolan doesn't need, who, who, yeah, who needs was, a bloody well, bodyguard? Well, Smith was one of his bodyguards, oh. apparently, but, you know, back in the day, because they were quite close, but, um, But who else needs bodyguards? Stanton Freeman never needed bodyguards. No. Steve Bassett doesn't need bodyguards. Why does Greer need bodyguards? And I know what he's going to say. It's because I'm so high level, man, and I've got all this stuff, stuff and they're going to try and get rid of me. And I, he's got every right to, to be concerned. I mean, he did lose a friend of his in the early 90s during the crop yeah. circle research yeah. thing. Yeah. I can't remember her name, but it was a close female friend of his. 
Yeah. But I think it's touched on his mm. book. I mean, you know, I mean, she she died of cancer. Yeah, he yeah. caught it as well as recovered. But there was a, there was an attack on them. But she would. I don't believe Greer knows more than what other people. A lot of people had had dealing with secret information. Uh, Richard Dolan does. Steve Bass. They people come to Steve Bass and Richard Dolan, and they tell them things, and they say don't tell anyone, and they have to hold it back before they've investigated it. You, Greer's nothing special in that respect. He, he's not alone. I mean, yeah, yeah. And also some of the scenes like when he breaks, and I know he's done this before. Where he sort of cries on camera, which I can understand like how much yeah. this subject means, you know. But I, putting that sort of doesn't always portray the best image, and you know, I know Powell Harris sort of. So it gives him a hug or whatever. Yeah. I know it can be very stressful and about what um, sometimes you need a, like a bit of a stiff upper lip to sort of you know, I don't know if it always portrays the best you know, the, the, what, how I would want to be seen like sort of It's know. difficult to know because of course I do, I do he does believe in this. I think he is sincere in that yeah. respect. He believes in what he's doing. He's made some errors, like we described some factual errors about this issue. Um, what what annoys me is that He's he's got to the point where he he's turning against people who won't join him and people who, who he was accusing people of various misdemeanors without really insufficient evidence. The only evidence yeah. he has, the only evidence he has, is that they are bringing out a line which he doesn't approve of. I mean, that makes him really rather like Richard D. Hall. Yeah, you know, he's, he's, it doesn't look good also because if, if something changes and like something comes to light where he's wrong about it and you know once you've recorded something you know people are always going to bring it up so yeah. it's, it's best to sort of remain on the fence you know give your point of view um, but yeah to attack other people I wouldn't say that's too, too no. good really um, did you see his um, he did like a little half hour round a couple of weeks before the film came out he did a half hour about round in his bedroom. Yeah, about the, the about, day, of the, the, about the announcement, about the. Um, those about Danny Sheehan, basically. Oh. Um, he actually, he actually, what, let, he actually gave what I think was a veiled threat to Danny Sheehan. Now, um, Danny Sheehan has been acting as his lawyer for, like I say, since the disclosure project was launched in 1993. Danny Sheehan has been the official solicitor for that. He spoke at the 2001 press conference. Um, he's very. He's very, he, he's very. De I like Danny Sheehan. He stuck. He, he also acted for John Max. So Danny, as a trained solicitor, will, will often act for people within the UFO community for just causes, such as when John Mack was being. He he represented John Mack in his employment tribunal, um, and he's of course he believes in the disclosure project. What happened is though, he decided to take take on Lou Elizondo's case because Lou Elizondo is currently suing the US Department of Defense for various uh, emails that uh, supposedly reveal things that I've come up with the details of the case. Greer is not happy with this. You can tell he's not happy because he believes Elizondo is a shell. Um, and again, he's as vocal and as, he's as vocal about this and has as little evidence as, as many other people, many other shill shamers and shill heads do. Um, and in this video, he basically said, um, I think Danny Sheehan should denounce, he should he insist that Lou Elizondo confesses to being an agent, a government agent. And if he doesn't, then I, I, I believe that Danny Sheehan will drop him as a client. And I'm like, what he's yeah. basically saying, he, I think what that really means is, Lou, he's saying, Danny, you better do as you're told and, 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 get, and, and get rid of Lou Elizondo, or I'm going to ca cast you out of the fold, man. You'll no longer be in my inner circle. You'll no longer be able to admire my muscles like everyone yeah, else can. I'm like, come across as a bit that was out of order. Deeper, that was fucking yeah. out of order. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Theatrical, like, yeah. Yeah. Danny, what, well, Danny should be able to, as a, Danny is not employed by Greer, Danny is a, a con, I think, he doesn't, he doesn't work as an employee of the Disclosure Project, I think he's freelance, he can represent whoever he bloody well likes, he's a freelance solicitor, yeah. you know, he, he doesn't work for any firm, if you work for some big firm, you've got to take on whatever cases the firm tell you to do, but he doesn't, he selects the cases he wants to take on, he's decided to represent Lou Elizondo, and why shouldn't, there's no evidence that Lou Elizondo was a shell. The only evidence, the only so-called evidence anyone's put forward is that he's saying things that people think are disinformation because of their own opinion on what's disinformation. That's all, that's yeah. all. I mean, it, with Richard Doty, it's a different matter because Richard Doty is, is confessed. Richard Doty confessed to spreading disinformation about UFOs. Yeah. 
yeah. Oddly enough, um, he's actually a, he's actually interviewed for this particular um, documentary. Yeah. Well, I think it may have been taken from a previous his previous. Did, documentary. did you mention that? Did you mention earlier on? Sorry, I forgot right. that that Doty actually has complained about how he's been. Yeah, he, he was saying that he felt it was sort of because it was sort of taken out of concept, context, I believe. Um, I can't remember what he said now. Was it was Doty talking about the abduction? It was about the my labs, yeah. Uh, yeah Doty yeah. was basically yeah. saying to Greer, "Yes, my labs take place." Yeah, yeah, and Greer sure. was saying, "Well, there you are. Then well, that's what alien abductions are. Unless yeah, they, unless you get yeah. abducted by the nice ones, oh, that's, then yeah. they're real." He's using like a <laughs> sentence that he's just using yeah. about a particular, but, but but that doesn't mean that Richard, you know, I, I, you know, thinks that. Either, you know, that all abductions are literary, that's mm. true. So, yeah, so you got to be careful when people sort of t take it out of context and stuff, so... Um, mm. I'm just going to show the viewers this beautiful view around us. We're actually in uh, West Berkshire now. This is this is the Peasmore area. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're, we're, we're getting close to the location where Pe the Peasmore base is supposed to be. And the weather is still holding out. I mean, the forecast is for showers. We haven't had any yet, which is nice. Um, on, on, a, on a happier note, though, Colin, um, there was this. The, the, the thing I did like about this particular documentary was it introduces a fascinating new piece of evidence, or a new case, the an alien abduction uh, photo. Did you see uh, that? You mean the auto autopsy? Yeah, uh, the uh, sorry, uh, a abduction. I meant uh, alien uh, autopsy. I thought that yeah. would interest you because you're well, the alien yeah, autopsy. Because I, I, this picture came out a couple of months ago, but there was no context uh, about oh, right. it or anything. I never saw it. Oh, okay. But you did make the rounds, but it was like other than it, but it wasn't. Again, the trouble with you know a lot of these pictures are they're not <laughs> totally clear. I mean, you can see a body on on a gurney or whatever. Um, but it's intriguing because I think the background was a woman who, now what did she say, she worked at a facility I think she, she worked at NASA, was it she NASA? Was handed it and, no, she worked at the, she worked at the atomic, in a, I think, not Older Master, what's it called? Um, where they developed the bomb in, with, uh, uh, in the yeah. States. Oh yeah, yeah. The equivalent, was it not Los Alamos? Uh, I forgot the name uh, of it, well, but Elgarda, yeah, uh, it but it's basically the place where um, they were developing the A bomb yeah. in the 1940s, and she actually this this photograph is much older. It's been dated to the 1920s. Yeah. I think it's a photo of a photo which they've been able to work out, and the, the clothing is of that time. And there is a couple of people that are in you know, the background who look like could be like government agents. Cause they're sort of wearing suits, but again. It's not totally clear the body mass, what you're looking at. It looks like a bit of a mess. Um, there may be sharper photos, um, but I mean, it's intriguing for sure. I mean, it's always, I mean, I'm quite open to the idea that there are photos, you know, that it's not something that just began in the 1940s or, or like Cape Girardeau or whatever. That there's no reason why there wasn't uh, bodies. Um, from crashes in the 20s you know you can go you can go back any year you can go back to any period in time that things this is the case of whether things will be retrieved and covered up by the aliens themselves of course or, or relevant authorities um, but you know it's an intriguing photo and if it, uh, a unique photo but um, yeah. it'd be nice to know a bit more about yeah, you know, why she was given the photo? How? What, what was it? You know, explained to her, um, and it was like I said, apparently a photo of a photo. But yeah, intriguing. And um, if you've not seen it before, it's, it's worth checking it out. It's actually, you can see it's very old. I mean, uh, Greer went to the he went to a museum of fashions and said, well, what, look at the hairstyles. Look at what they're wearing. When was this? The guy said, definitely 1920s. The you see like some. Well, people, guys who look like doctors, they're wearing like yeah. uh, smocks, white smocks, and they are the, the the body. It looks like a body anyway. It's lying on a on yeah. an examination table. It's very tall. I'd say at least seven feet tall, um, and it looks. I mean, if that was a human, it would look like a disfigured human, like it'd been, been burned, a burnt body or something like that. Or it's yeah, not it so advanced be, yeah. in composition. But standing, there's about I think there's probably about eight eight yeah, or nine people yeah, in the yeah. photo. I don't recognise any of them. I don't think they're famous people. I don't recognise any of the figures. There are some guys standing behind, like you say, wearing black yeah. suits, as if they're from the FBI or yeah. something, whatever the equivalent was in those days. Yeah. But um, 
the, unfortunately the photo has faded. It's like you say, maybe a photo of a photo. Yeah, it it's also damaged. damaged. Yeah, it I seems to have. Damaged. It seems to have like a crease either from folding or mold uh, or burning or sometimes when you fold yeah. things over, you get like mold and cracking. It seems to be. It's damaged, unfortunately, this photograph. Um, but it is discernible. I'd, I'd love to know more about it. Is, does the negative still exist? Does anyone recognize any of the figures? Does anyone look and say, oh no, that's my granddad. He was in the medical corps in whatever, you know. It'd be interesting to see if anyone recognizes any of the figures, whether the negative still exists, whether, do you think it might have been part of an album and there's more? Well, Photos like it? I mean, don't know, do you? I'd like to, I'd love to know more about it. So, uh, hats or credit where credit is due. Greer was right to bring that up. Um, it looks, it's a lot more interesting than the Atacama humanoid. Um, I really think that this is, uh, this is like, could it could turn out to be quite significant. And you make a good point, though, Colin. And I mean, we both were listening to old uh, Philip Mantle on the with Chris Evers and these other people. All oh, right, Steve sat now, just no, no. butting in again. Now, I'm talking about the Cape Girardeau incident uh, of 1941. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you listen to that show? Yeah, I watched a little bit of it. What's interesting is that people like Bassett were saying, like, Roswell basically was when the, the, the truth embargo began with Roswell. I have said before, there's very good reason to think that Roswell was not the first Roswell. And there were, I've written an entire article on how I believe a crash retrieval events dating back pr before 1947. Cape Girardeau's one, there's others as well. As if so, by the time Roswell happened, excuse me, the, pol the policy that we have today was already in place. The reason the, uh, the newspaper was report, report went out is because of basically something went wrong. Something went wrong in the. Um, something went wrong in the, in the cover-up and the, the newspaper article was published but the decision to start the cover-up wasn't made then the response from the authorities were of people who seemed to know what they were doing to Roswell just like with the Pentech incident your people turned up who seemed to know what they were doing as if they were re familiar with things like yeah. the Roswell incident um, but um, yeah that was an interesting photograph that um, very interesting photograph I'd love to know more about it Chris knows the person it came from um, but we, it's, we only know about it. We only know it's, its ownership can only be traced back to 1940 something, even though it's, the photo itself is about 20 years older. Um, so it could be that the person who owned it at the, the National Laboratories was not the photo, not the photographer. Yeah, they may have got it from someone else. Uh, but this could be a real smoking gun, though, Carl. It really could. I think so. I think so. Um, like the, you know, uh, things can. This is a good thing. Things can just turn up out of the blue. You know, you don't really yeah. know. I mean, this might be one of the real. Maybe people are sitting on stuff because now would be a, like. Um, now, now is a good time. Do you know? Because they feel safer to talk about stuff. You know, or whatever. Yeah. So this is the thing. This is a very, very good time. This is the climate is very, very pleasant at the moment. Oh, nice it's a Porsche. Nice car. It's a nice Porsche. Oh, there. Get out of the way. Man. Yeah. Um, the, the the climate is very very good at the moment. This is, the iron is hot to strike for yeah. whistleblowers. I believe that um, we're going to see more whistleblowers simply because the ones we've had so far, Fravor and people like that, have had indeed on Elizondo, who could be classified as such, have essentially been treated much better than all the warnings you get about things like this. Um, and like for example. We had a situation a couple of weeks ago, before about two weeks before the UAPTF report was published, that the sum, a summary of it was leaked to the. Excuse me. A summary was leaked to the New York Times, and Blumenthal and Kane wrote about it. Um, now the the senator is obviously someone on either the Armed Service or Intelligence Committees in the Senate. <coughs> excuse me. Whoever did it, obviously it's not a big deal because this was published. But as we know, as they've admitted, there is a classified annex, they call it. Now, if someone were to, le someone were to leak that, obviously it'd be a much more serious offence. Far more serious. Because that's leaking, class that's not just leaking public information a couple of weeks early, that's leaking classified information. However, I believe there's an incentive to do it, because the person who did it will probably be treated quite leniently, more lenient than they would have, because they'd have a lot of public support, if they, for example, were acquitted, or they got like a, a, a very light sentence through mitigation, that would set a common law precedent 
And it may well be the first snowflake, snowflake of an avalanche of people. I hope so. I hope so. What do you reckon of that? Yeah, I mean, it could be like, things could be, um, I still feel like there's, just, there's like a sort of schedule that things will be released by and maybe people are sitting on certain documents, like even you know, going back to the photos and things like that. Um, so maybe this is all being drawn up on a chalkboard or, or uh, something, you know, like maybe a bit more sophisticated than a chalkboard. But, you know, mm. they, they, they've, they've got a time frame possibly for the next decade. I do feel like this decade is very important. The next, even the fi next five years. Um, oh, yeah. So f there has to be something. But it, it does seem a battle going on between it's like, um, you know, like the good guys will do something, the bad guys will counter it. And, um, and that may be the way that the disclosure thing's going to come out, but they're going to, you know, they, they might try and spin it for their own ends. Um, but uh, I think you know, there's definitely two competing sides. And I think as long as we remember that, then we, that might make sense of some of the things that, you know, we get frustrated out, out, uh, over and stuff. So, um, I just feel like we're definitely living as good a time as any for this subject, you know. People yeah. have waited whole, spent whole lifetimes waiting for days like these for... Oh, well, yeah. So you can't, you know, you, sort of, you joined it at the right time, really. Yeah. Um, I think this is why you do have a lot of people new to ufology now. The so-called young guns. Yeah. People who got into it literally in the last couple of years because of new ufology. But that's good. I mean, yeah, I, 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 unlike Greer, you know, I welcome a bit of um, if, I don't know if healthy competition is the word. Well, Other people uh, involved. I mean, more the merrier. People I don't can make a breakthrough. Yeah. You know, the more people working on a problem, the more solutions will be offered. Um, the more, you know, it, it's a battle. I mean, for some, you know, I see it. I always see it as a, like a long battle. Um, yeah, it, it is. It is like that. It is a battle. Uh, but I do feel things have. There's no doubt that the whole, ever since 2017, and we remember where we were actually in Miles' studio when it, the news broke, from that moment onwards, everything changed. And since then, we've been on a new path. And where it's gonna, where it's gonna go, I don't know, but the, the fact that the, the truth embargo, or the, whatever it was, changed its tactics so radically and so permanently is interesting. I think it's encouraging. What's your yeah, opinion? Absolutely, and I think even, you know, as a result of all the COVID stuff, I think, that that is all influential in the sub, you know, in more coming out about it. I just feel like there's so much at stake. There's so much, uh, you know. People, are, I said this before, where people are worried that things could fall apart because of, uh, you know, what's happened this last year. And but I think people need a bit of hope that there is positive things out there, whether that's, you know, friendly extraterrestrials or, or just the idea that there are extraterrestrials, um, that there's these technologies that are possibly on their way to being released um, to the public sector rather than, you know, the, the military industrial complex where it seems to have been hidden. Um, so I just feel like everything's happening for a reason and, and maybe all these strands will come together at one point where there's, there is some sort of revelation um, or at least something that brings us closer to the truth. I mean, you know, I'm not expecting, you know, full disclosure um, every, you know, it might just be a subtle one. And I don't have a bit of problem with that because I know it can be quite shocking to, for people for, like, normies to sort of wake up to the reality of it all. So, um, We'll see what happens, but you know, it's encouraging. Um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, but I, I feel, I do feel encouraged. And like I, I don't, I don't go along with what some people are going along with, which is essentially the paradigm of prevention. Some people are simply assuming the whole thing is some big bluff, and it's just to imprison us further um, and to, to make it worse. This is Greer's line, really. Uh, I. I think that's something we need to be on our guard against. Yeah. I don't think this means that Elizondo and Leslie Kane are shills, etc. But it's something we need to be on our guard against. And Carol Rosin, I mean, the warning of Carol Rosin, which she passed on from Werner von Braun, is something we should take on board. But at the same time, if we, if we just assume the worst, we miss out on an opportunity. 
Oh, oh, you I really miss out on an yeah, opportunity. I mean, an opportunity. It's too good an opportunity to miss out on coal. It really is. Oh yeah, because even if, if they do try and spin it, at least, well, at least we, we'll, we'll have, the, well we should have a say in the matter of being people who study the subject, but we, we're, we're entitled to our opinion to counter yeah. any claims of deception and um, bring up the relevant cases where, you know, where we can present our own views on it. So I don't have a problem with the, you know, the dark ones want to sort of mm. shaft us with their, um, yeah. you know, their, their, their disinfo and, uh, you know, false flags and shit, but at least, you know, at least we can have the debate, because, you know, if, if they don't want to have a debate with us, and that just reveals them even more, because they obviously are scared that we've got a valid point of view that they're not expressing, you know, they just, mm. you know, it's clearly for them it's going to be something where it can use fear to control the masses when, you know like oh, if as Covid has been and if they yeah. can like ram up more fear and say well we've got you know aliens have destroyed um, such and such where we putting curfews on you know these creatures are out there they're going to be swooping from the skies they're taking our children you know you know, yeah, taking you know. Your, your wife, your girlfriends and stuff, you know. <laughs> you know, this is the sort of thing that would, does work on, so, so sort of psychologically, you know, if you can really put the fear of God and, 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 you, and, and you know, to show, have footage of stuff as well, where you mm -hmm. can show people being killed, like 9-11, and, and, and put it on a cosmic, so you know, I do go along with the cosmic hoax sort of type, I mean, it was a good idea to call something like that, where something, um, can be manipulated and, 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 and so in, in that regard I don't, just, um, yeah, I don't want to dismiss the entire thesis no you know? no I mean I, I personally see if if if, it, if something happens like for example a flying saucer comes down and blows up the White House Independence Day style <laughs> and someone says oh we need a, a state of emergency to yeah, protect the planet yeah. temporary of course I will be the first person to call that out I'll be the first person to say how do you know how do you know this is a these are real aliens how do you know that this isn't like a big stage yeah. gay op by the, the powers that be I'll be the first person to say that uh, but all I'm but I, I just think career just goes over the top yeah he's just assumed you know, like many many people he's not alone actually in assuming that is exactly what's going on therefore we, we should reject everything in new ufology as a fraud and anyone who believes in it is either on the side of the devils or they're naive um, is totally unfair and if, if they're wrong you see if these people are wrong about it and it's not that it is it really is a real disclosure with a capital D and good guys maybe QAnon or whoever's on the inside still has control then just think of the opportunity we'll miss out on yeah. we've really got to we've really got to we've got to tread a fine line I think between excessive naivety and excessive cynicism um, and that's what I'm trying to do I'm trying to find a balance between those things because like, no one knows yet what's really going on nobody does people pretend to Greer thinks he does he pretends to other people pretend to no one knows for sure I don't think oh, no, no one no. knows for sure uh, and because they're reluctant to talk themselves the military about the cases that sort of does give ufologists a chance to have more press and more publicity ho hopefully yeah. and more respectability <laughs> because of the nature now the seriousness of the subject so you know we're not the crazy mm. people who've been saying all along that these things are real you know? well this is why i'm wearing this t-shirt here the little flying saucer there you see if you follow me on facebook you already see the picture of this a little flying saucer at the top there see it past the seatbelt and it says told you so uh -huh. <laughs> and we did tell you so yeah, <laughs> you know it's colin it's brain, a... you're backing a winning horse like yeah blues, definitely really i mean it's such an obvious one I think for a lot of people why they don't want to go there is because it's such a big subject and they get a bit scared about the big questions in life they do yeah and that's like goes with things like like life after death as well people try and avoid these things and mm. although in some ways maybe the ET thing is a bit more you know maybe not so scary for people as some it's, like as yeah. their own mortality or whatever but um, yeah um, the, the, the idea, the, the politics of the afterlife research is very interesting. Um, I've always been meaning to do a full-length video on that. Well, I kind of did with the, my review of the of the dis, of the Discovery film. Um, that was very good. But aliens do frighten people. The idea of aliens frighten people in a sense. People have been programmed, um, especially older boomer type people, to be afraid because really, go through the fifties and sixties, most science fiction films involved. These, these sort of scenarios, alien invasion, 
um, occupation, evil aliens doing abductions and trying to take over, you know, um, things like that. And so, oh, yeah, I think yeah. we must. Be, I think we're getting close to Marlborough now. So hopefully, we'll show you the yeah. the old Bridge of Sighs again at the school. Oh, a mm. a, at the I'll show you a little bit of the, the sights here. It's a nice little village. Oh, this is Hungerford. It's a lovely little area. This Hungerford. It's some nice place. This is, we're getting close to the sort of like, you see little thatched cottages. We're, we're getting close to that kind of area oh, yeah, now. The, the oh. massacre, was it 87, was it? The Hungerford Massacre? Oh yeah, the guy with, the guy, yeah, um, Richard E. Hall talked about that, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, he, he sounds like, like a mind control subject. Um, basically went crazy with a gun, started killing people in his town. <sighs> right, Michael Ryan, his name was, I remember. You're right. <clears throat> yeah, I remember. Now there's um yeah there's like, like uh, I think people are scared of that. I mean, and to be honest, it's, it's a lot of it is our uh, the very propaganda that the government have been using on people for decades is what's led them into this mindset. This is why they're scared. Everyone's going to panic. I mean, the reason one of the reasons they're scared everyone's going to panic is partly contempt for people, but it's also because that's how they've they've manipulated us to be. They've manipulated us to be weak and fearful people, very short-sighted and um, unable to contemplate long-term consequences of actions. So yeah, they are scared we're going to panic because that's what we've been programmed to do. Um, I, just, I think hopefully enough people, if we can hit that 100th monkey point, will be able to see through it. And Ian R. Crane, the, the late great Ian R. Crane, to whom I'll be dedicating my talk on Saturday, he says, you know, if this happens, we should step back, take a moment of pause, and wonder what it's really all about. Because I, I think they were probably planning something for the 2012 Olympics, as Ian said. I think they were planning oh, something sure they've got, I think it's a full-time job. They're working, creating plans and what works. And I suppose it's needed, like, a, you know, there's a danger of obviously waking more people up when you when you do false flag events because yeah, you can only, bad you can, fire, you can only use these false flag events for a certain amount of time when people get it's either very cynical or wise to it um, and certainly mm. the more out there sort of false flags you do you know things like asteroids extraterrestrials and stuff I mean people I think this COVID one is you know that for a lot of people that was that was a that was a, already a step too far, and that's oh, God, it's yeah. a wake, but it's awakened so many people, I think. And um, you know, I was at the march the uh, last weekend in London, and um, you know, you can see there is this peak, there's, there's this growing amount of people who are questioning things and, and their whole view of reality as if they've suddenly woken up from you know, slumber or something. And, um, yeah, so it's. It's best of times is the worst of times, as someone. <laughs> yeah, it's. I. Uh, it, it's a. It's a weird situation. I mean, when COVID happened, I, I mean, I knew exactly what it was, but. It, it's obviously it was there 2016. ETV. ETV. Oh, we got. What's ETV stand for? Extraterrestrial vehicle. Oh, we're gonna be. We're, we're, we're scanned by an alien. <laughs> There's an alien car ahead of us. ETV. <laughs> but you know, like. Um, you know, ex but I tell you, there's. Um, Obviously, the, the C-19 pandemic has basically, it's their 2016. That is, they are, they've brought something in to try and stop anything like 2016 happening again. They've, I've said, talked about this before, they're kicking back. They, it's, now, obviously, that is now jumping the shark. And they're finding it harder and harder to justify lockdowns. They'll, but one thing they won't do is leave us alone. They won't leave us in no, peace. Some new crisis will come about. That. The thing about a fake alien invasion is it's all or nothing. <clears throat> if they do that, they're going for broke, they're going for double yeah. or quit. Because a, a fake alien invasion obviously involves ET disclosure. Mm. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. If we ever have disclosure, ET disclosure, then the New World Order is finished. It cannot happen. It literally is impossible. With, yeah. kind of, um, if there's too much there's too much behind it, like it, it goes against all their the propaganda since the beginning of time that we have to believe we're alone stuff to do with free energy and stuff like that again these new world orders not possible in a free energy environment um you know we could set up our own georgia guidestones with these conditions on if we wanted to which means if easy disclosure happens 
that's when you can sit back and relax because that's basically the end of the new world order no doubt about it if it's just a, you just to sit back and relax and just watch the rest of it fall apart if that ever happens however if we have the et disclosure and it's evil nasty aliens it will, you know coming down from the planet zog to, to kidnap your women and children and, and it will blow up buildings and things like that then you know very well that um it's, it's actually an ET false flag. It's actually a false flag operation. Because, of course, there's always the risk there might be a real alien invasion. But the thing is, the real alien invasion has already happened. It happened a long time ago. <clears throat> we are already under a... Um, being, we're being monitored. We've been controlled. This planet is occupied by aliens already. So that's already done and dusted, I think. Hell, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, the only other thing I'll be wary of would be... Um that, you know, like using it like a fake second coming and the whole anti oh, yeah, thing. That would be right. where, that would be the one where they, you know, we said they go for broke. That would be literally a, a change where they sort of usher in. Because I do feel like there's a strong link between the uh, anti so called Antichrist and um, extraterrestrial subject. Because I think if they catch such a character was to appear, so like in Israel or the Mount of, Olives, or Mount of Olives or something like that, then he would have to refer to these off planet beings and come up with uh, either uh, an explanation that sort of, you know, a storyline that explains all that narrative whether whether he this person wants to say that they're demonic and that you know these are these are you know whatever all the spin so that is one thing i would be i think is actually probably going to happen actually yeah. if i was a betting man i think that that's that will involve the subject of ufos but bent towards that character's own sort of agenda um, yeah, it's so. could be like Louis Farrakhan, you know, wheels of light, the wheels of light. Yeah. I so. actually think the actual Antichrist might be an off-planet being himself. Actually, I, I mm. go that far. I actually would like to do a talk about that at some point in the future. Well, I, think, idea, yeah. I think there is something to that that you can't be a normal human, to even. And I don't think they're going to say that it's Jesus or anything because that I, I don't think you can pull. You know, the wall over people's eyes in that in that way. Um, it would be someone who might claim to know Jesus or be connected to Jesus, but it wouldn't be Jesus. But I I, I do feel like they might even use the ET thing for their benefit. Um, and I sometimes wonder also whether they'll be a bit of a you know possibly a true firm and, and you know might actually agree with some of our principles like things like 9-11 and they may have evidence like that so that might put us in an awkward situation because they might not necessarily be telling 100% lies you know but a lot of it could be actually stuff that you know we as truthers actually accept you know that i.e you know et's are real 9-11 was a false flag and all this stuff uh, so there is a danger there to sort of have a character appear who I'd be very suspicious of um, telling, you know, us what some of us have been saying a long time, but at the same time also placating people of various religions. Um, because if someone like that was to appear, you'd have to you know, try and unite a lot of, you know, the religions, the Christians, the you know, Jews, the, the, the Muslims. Yeah. Um, so you, I just feel like something's probably been thought out quite in a, quite a way that something like that will happen, and I reckon it might happen. Ten years, even. <laughs> All right, they're obviously going to have to. <clears throat> at some point, they're going to to bring in their new world order. They, every, everything's backfiring right now. They, they're going to go for broke at some point. They really will. I mean, the coronavirus is, is an attempt to yeah. try and lock us down into the new world order. It's, they're going to try another one at some point, and they'll keep going. They, they'll keep going and going. But a fake second coming is not unlike. I think it is a possibility. It's perfectly possible. I mean. Um, because a lot of people would view the ET uh, UFO phenomena as a form of second coming, uh, as you know, like angels and demons. So mm. it's just a case of shocking people so much that um, that I mean, if you were suddenly to see stuff appear in the skies and that, I mean, and you're not used to UFOs, um, then you're either going to feel like that this is you know godlike things because. You know, we're not flying around. Well, we're told we're not flying around in spacecraft where we probably are. Yeah. That's another part of the deception, arguably. Yeah, but um, well, well, I think for many yeah. people to, to have that and see stuff manifested by, you know, you could literally just go outside and see. Well, I'm reminded of like V, you know, the TV series, when they, they yeah. suddenly appeared everywhere over these big cities and that. But whether that would be allowed by positive VT groups themselves, you know, is open to debate. And, 
we don't we can't predict yet we, we could be on our guard because a second coming of, of Jesus would it was unite the Christian and Muslim world into a certain mindset um, it would it's perfectly possible to fake things in the sky you see it's you can do it with uh, laser displays I've seen sky laser displays and they're very very realistic there's also drone swarm displays that we saw during the new year which was um, things like that and and indeed secret aircraft I wouldn't be surprised they may say at some point something like um, well we we're being invaded right now by aliens. the Space Force that Trump set up it's there's a lot more to it than we, we told you beforehand that we've got these craft and that craft we've been um, we, we we, classi we had pla classified anti-gravity like in the 50s and we've been developing it ever since we didn't want to we, we, we know we should have told you we should have allowed you access to it but we were concerned about the aliens because we we had to deal with the alien threat you know it's something like that well that's another thing because I do remember like a channel message from about five years ago um, so hinting about that well they were gonna sort of do like a false flag alien attack and then have this Antichrist character appear that would um, through whatever means quell you know stop this attack and that's when you know people will sort of fall at the feet of this person because they have actually sort of some control over what's happening in the heavens so maybe uh, this person and you know their entourage for, you know because I can't I have to think that it would be more you know some sort of big following that they would have as well that you know that maybe they'll create you know the false flag event and then they would sort of rescue us, so to speak, from these yeah. aliens and demons or whatever spin yeah. they put on it. So that's, that's, a, that's a concern, I'd say. Yeah, that's, I think, is a possibility as well. Um, I, it, all these things, I mean, I'll, I'll go into more detail in my, talk, in my talk, but all these things could come about, all these things could happen. We do, yeah. You know, everything's on, you know, on the board, isn't it? Now, yeah, now, now we, we, we're sort of like, it's like um, the up and like these biblical seals have been opened, it's like we're a step further to some sort of amazing revelations coming, I think, whether they, you know, yeah. whatever they are, whether it's... Well, funny enough, there's a new film, I've not seen it yet, but it's just come out, it's called Fatima. Ah, and oh it's, yeah. it's about the oh, Fatima apparitions. I think I've seen it. It was in a couple of selected cinemas, I'd like to see it. It's, oh, um, yeah. but it's, uh, it's about the Fatima uh, apparitions, I think, took place in... Excuse me. <laughs> In uh, World War One, um, in Portugal. Now, they, these things are, are, have connections. They've obviously been interpreted by the church as Marian apparitions. Mm -hmm. However, they also have s some similarities to UFO contact and ex um, mass contact experience. Yeah. So, I'm yeah. curious to see how this film actually spins it. You know. On the subject of films, have you seen the Eleventh Green? Uh, no, actually, after I, mean, I told you about it, and then I haven't, haven't, we had to, oh, right. I haven't actually seen it myself. But I, I heard you say it was good, but I, but oh, I will yeah. watch it. I will make, I will pay for it and watch it. So what do you, mm. what did you make? Of it? Well, it's it's only three forty nine on Amazon, and I decided to rent it, and I was very impressed. If I watch it again, I'm going to buy it. Actually, um, it's a, it's a film. It's actually an independent film, but it's a quite sophisticated one. It's obviously got a decent budget. It's it's not like a excuse me. It's not like a, a homemade film like Awakening of Twelve Strands. No offence to, to Sandra and what she achieved there, that's a very good film. This is clearly a studio made, very, very sophisticated thing. The actors and actresses are people you may recognise, they've been there in Hollywood. And they're not like household names, but they are high-level Hollywood actors, B-list type actors. And um, the film is about the various and it, it, it makes no I don't want to spoil it for Colin but I'll, I'll say oh, well, it I, know, I, can. I know roughly what it's about mm. I did read your review actually of it I think oh cool cool it, it's it's about basically um, <coughs> um, Dwight Eisenhower when he was president he seems to have had a lot of interaction with the ET cover-up and ET, the ET issue and the secret government and secret space program in a way that other presidents didn't before or since um, he was president from, I think it was, uh, was it 54 to 61? Um, yeah, he was. Um, he was succeeded by Kennedy. He came after Truman and was succeeded by Kennedy. Um, it, it basically centers around this journalist who has, whose dad just died. His dad was like a staffer for Eisenhower. And um, what's interesting about it, I think, is that there's all kinds of scenes of like secret meetings and things like that. And Obama is in it as well. 
oh, and the president of Obama, and he he meets these people who he meets this group of people who show him free energy devices, oh. and um, he says they, they, this 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 is kind of slip of the tongue because the guy says these are the, these are the best things that could help your planet. Oh, I mean um, our planet, as if suggesting this guy's an alien who's showing Obama this free energy. And uh, they really, I say, it, it's, it's it's completely unapologetic in its portrayal of the ET cover-up thing. I'll go through Marlborough now, so I'll let you guys watch this. I'll get you guys see. It's completely unapologetic in how totally um, de deep it goes into the kind of things we talk about. There's no attempt to, oh, let's just be sensible about this. It, okay. it goes straight into the kind of things we like. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And it's really, ma I, my review, I wrote a review on Amazon, it's made for ufologists, I call it, and it is. The guy, who, he, he, there's, I've watched an interview with the, with the director, producer, and, and the writer, producer, director, it was all the brainchild of this guy. And yeah, he's very, he's very, very well researched into all this. Is the kind of, he, he's been to UFO conferences and things like that. He's been to the kind of conferences that we're about to go to. He, he's, he's familiar with our worldview. This this lovely town of Marlborough, which you'll remember from my video, because there was a conference here, if you remember. Yes, uh, the bases at Merlin's Mound. Um, so the whole yeah, it's uh, it's really worth. I'd say just go and watch it. It's very well done. Um, very good acting in it. And it's, I think it's, again, it's come out at just the right time. It came out last year. <coughs> it is just the uh, right time. I think we're going to see more films like this, Colin. Yeah. <coughs> Explain what, it, what, it, what the 11th Green means, because that's quite relevant, isn't it? Yeah, the 11th Green is basically, it's a, it refers, of course, to golf. Uh, Eisenhower, like, like a lot of posh Americans, plays golf. And it refers to discussions that he had while he was playing golf with various people, because that's what they do. They, 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 if they want to subvert someone, they'll often take them out for a round of golf. Well, is he a mason as well? Because the golf course are often associated with masons, aren't they? Like yeah. The, um, he, he was, I don't... Lodges and stuff, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, there was a, there is a, I think there is a, they talk about that in one of the, somewhere in the plot. It's very well done. I mean, it's very different from like, I mean, I was watching, if, you, if you're familiar with, very, it's a very cheap, very crude and blunt kind of movies with this kind of theme, like Roland Emmerich and his, uh, his work like on Stargate and Independence Day and things like that. This is a lot more sophisticated. This presents people exactly all the kind of arguments you think it was in there. Do you remember that's where it was in Maudlin School? Um, <coughs> um, for example, the guy Jeremy, the central character, <coughs> the guy whose father died, he's ma he has this wife. They present this radio TV show together. She is like kind of like a bit of a cover-up apologist. She says, she, she doesn't go as far as I think the cover-up's a good thing, but she said, I understand why they did it. I think people aren't ready to hear the truth, and I think I'm not. And what's really interesting is the whole scenario appears to have emerged, the, the whole the story comes to see at the very, very start of a disclosure event. For example, the first scene in the film is Jeremy and his wife presenting this program and they're talking about like anti-gravity technology that's just been leaked, which would be a disclosure event because if, if someone leaks anti-gravity technology, the, the story goes, where did you get this from? Was it invented by humans? And then they'll say, no, no, some of it came from aliens. And, and then you, 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 that's, that's the can of worms that cannot be closed again. So I, honestly, go and watch, I mean, go and watch this, this film. If it's, you can rent it like on Amazon, it's on, you can rent it on YouTube, only a couple of quid, Worth it, definitely. Thumbs up, I, like I said, I did a review of it and I thought it was pretty good. <clears throat> kind of reminds me when, um, was it Truman had a dental appointment or something on his record and people said, oh, that was when he was supposed to have gone and seen some ETs being carved up or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, hear these sort of stories. So sometimes they have these, um, you know, things in their diary which are like covers, yeah. you know, well, the official record, people people refer to, well, you know, he was here on that day, and, but, you know. Well, like they, what happened is he supposed to have gone to the dentist on a particular day, and he spent yeah. a few hours at the dentist, yeah. The, the dentist's own record show no appointments with Harry S, none at all. Uh, yeah. So that's the thing that... Yeah, that's it. I mean, and you know, yeah, it's not going to be on their official record. You know, saying, so, "Oh, yeah, today I visited, went to Dallas for uh, alien autopsy." Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they have to, they have to count for the president's location, which is why they do these 
kind of like fake. Um, they put up these kind of fake appointments for presidents. Yeah, so, I mean, common sense. But, uh, I look forward to watching it. Actually, I know it does sound good. So. Um, yeah, that's it. I really do recommend go watch that, guys. I've written a review without spoilers on. I, I only found out about it because Paul Blake Smith mentioned it in that interview with um, Philip Mantle and Chris Evers because he was. I never even heard of it until then, so that's how I literally found out about it. Oh, right, uh, yeah. He, when talking about Cape Girardo, he, was, he, he made reference to this, and then that's when I posted the link on my group. So, yeah, you find out interesting things. Uh, you know, sometimes you think, oh, everything's. You know, information's all out there, but you find out because this was released like a year ago I think. It's not new yeah I'm surprised I didn't hear about it when it came out because it's exactly the kind of thing I normally keep an eye a lookout for so uh, if any of you guys have come well, across I mean, any videos you think oh well, I uh, think did you watch the, I think I sent you a link but there was an interview with uh, was it the producer I don't yeah. so I, I don't know if you watched that I haven't watched that but David I mean, Munch he, 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 yeah, he, he wrote it directed oh, and produced the film yeah and is he I mean does he talk about how does he is he making any more of type fibless sort of films or is he, does he talk about having personal experiences or anything? Um, he doesn't know, uh, but what he, all he says is he talks about like the, the making of the film. He's um, quite he, knowledgeable. He though, pays tribute to the, the, the guy who played Eisenhower died, unfortunately, soon after production. Um, he's quite old because of course Eisen, it, it's it's set in the 1967 when Eisenhower was very old. In fact, he died in 69 after he was president. He's still like involved though, because US presidents actually, they never really retire. I mean, even after they're left office, they're often called and phoned up and told they want to do things and um, and ask for advice and, and where they can help with this. In fact, the most obvious example is Trump, because I mean, President Trump is like, uh, he's the most active ex-president ever. And yeah. um, you know, we have, he's now suing Silicon Valley. I mean, a bloody good job. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it, it doesn't. It mentions Gerard. Okay, Gerard mentions the Kecksburg incident. It's slightly ahistorical because Kecksburg was actually sixty-five, not sixty-seven. But um, he mentions it. He's like on the phone. Eisenhower's on the phone talking about the Kecksburg crash, which may well have been actually. Um, I think it's quite likely to have been a man-made anti-gravity craft. Some people say it was a satellite. I'm not sure. Yeah. We yeah. got like a cash lunch from one. Yeah, oh, that, that happened on the same time as Rendlesham Forest, didn't it? Have, has anyone made a movie about that? <laughs> well, you did share, a, you did share like a... Oh, you're talking cash, cash, <coughs> I thought you were being... You're talking about cash landrum? Mm. Uh, uh, no, I don't think they have. I don't think so. I don't, all I remember is it happened at... There's these two women in a car. It was a good a recreation on that, so I thought history is still a good uh, recreation of it, I believe. Uh, they did. A, they did that segment. I think I posted it on my group, but mm. yeah, that's worth checking out. But I suppose a film wouldn't really run too much, or other than maybe. F well, no, I suppose it would be a good film because you could have all the, um, you know, taking the government to court and that. But yeah, um, it's quite a sad ending for that family. You know? Unfortunately, this is what I mean. That, that sometimes people, the the experiences people have, there are deaths that result from you eating contact. There are permanent disappearances involved with alien abduction and um, yeah I don't it's see, not always a happy I do trust what Dick Wigdoty said actually but I mean I did go along with that what he was claiming but it was um, you know it was a back engineered craft of a nuclear reactor we would kind of explain why there was like these 30 hel helicopters sort of assisting it um, yeah you know, I mean I don't really ever you know I think it could be, then you've got to ask yourself why was it flying over a busy road in, in, in Christmas yeah, in, in, over Christmas time? Yeah, I, well, it, it's possible it was when it went off course. Yeah, but, um, yeah, but it was, was it Texas? Was it? I can't remember. I'm not sure, but I, I remember that it was quite a remote yeah. place. I, I mean, it wasn't, I think they were the only one. Really. Anyway, strange things do happen, as we know. And, yeah. yeah, and now we, I think, oh, we're, we're getting close to April. Oh, this is uh, the most lovely. This is that we're in the Vale of Pusey now, and this is absolutely lovely. This, the bus comes on this way. Um, as, I, as you know, it's the most, it's my favourite bus ride, uh, and uh, you can see so much here. It's just lovely. But yeah, Colin, it's. Um, I mean, I can't help taking everything Richard Doty says with a pinch of salt. However, I know. I, I know. We, I kind of. I think um, we disagree a bit with Rick Doty. I actually don't mind. Maybe because I met. Him I wouldn't ignore well. him. I wouldn't um, ignore him. No, he's I mean, quite an yeah. entertainer. I wouldn't um, ignore him. I wouldn't say don't ignore mind. him. Um, I don't know, it's an interesting character. He's arguably one of the most controversial characters in ufology, you could argue. Yeah. Um, he's but, certainly high up there, I'll tell you. But he's not a sceptic. I mean, we you know he's not saying that. Mm. You know, I'd like to actually know what... Um, 
Elizondo and the other thing about I don't think they've ever been asked about Ringo. I mean, it'd be no. nice to see them two in the room together because yeah, really, that's very controversial because he's obviously the Office of um, Special Investigation, OSI, OSI, mm. and um, you know I, I'm sure Melody. There's Silbury and, Hill. Uh, yeah, there you go. There is Yeah, and yeah. uh, Melody, you see, like. It's hard to know. I would, like, I would like to see them debate. I would. I would like to because see them. Because Doty's actually witnessed crash retrieval footage, you know, in, I think in the 80, early 80s, and, you know, he was shown all this stuff. So he's seen more evidence. And, you know, so you does kind of, you know, make you scratch your head when yeah. you're sort of talking about, you know, crap, you know, lights in the sky and, and you know. Definitely. I certainly, wouldn't, I, would, I certainly wouldn't advocate ignoring everything Doty says. Absolutely no, not. I mean, give him a chance to say what he, he, he believes. On the other hand, um, on the other hand, um, you know, he, he's, he's confessed to being an active disinformation agent. So. But uh, is, is that, in that uh, cosmic hoax, what do you think of old? Uh, was it um, that, what's his name Warner? Oh. He's actually he's Mellon's nephew. Oh, oh yeah. What's his name? Is it Rick Warner? I can't remember. He, yeah, well, oh, was he connected to? I didn't really grasp that. Was he connected to Mellon? Was he's he? He's Mellon's nephew, and he's like turned completely okay. against him and said, uh, basically, uh, Mellon is just. He's like really. I saw him. Uh, he did an interview with Ryan. I think it was Ryan Sprag. Um, somewhere in the skies, and um, he did some kind of. What's the word? He did some kind of say he was basically a, a tell all about the Mellon family, and, which of course, because of course, they are from a kind of elite family, the Mellons. They're an elite British, elite sort of aristocratic US family. I think like that. And it's the Beckhampton roundabout, eighth breeze to our right. <coughs> We're going through the uh, Sidonia Mirror Complex at the moment, aren't we? Like, which is this is I forgot what. Uh, I'm heading the closer devices. I can't remember exactly what Beckhampton roundabout represents on the, you know, on the Sidonia complex. But I think it's like those four stones. Do you remember? Yeah. There's like four stones in a pattern at the Beckhampton McDonald's roundabout. There, apparently, yeah, oh, that's the aliens were representing yeah. McDonald's. Yeah. But, uh, but here we have this love. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? It's like a, it's like an X-shaped series of roads that go different ways. This one goes down towards Calm and um, devices. Um, and you'll see, like the in a moment, you're going to see the uh, what's that obelisk the, the, on top of the hill. I showed you last time we were here because on that great escape video, I'll put a link in the description box to my great escape video. There's lots of tumuli along here, ancient burial mounds. Funny enough, we saw I saw two police cars on blue lights go past. Yeah, there was an undercover one. Uh, yeah, one was one was marked, the other was unmarked. Yeah. Another was. Yeah. Isn't it lovely along here? Yeah, that's yeah it. the weather's kept dry because we had a bit of dry, a bit of weather, a lot of rain in London. But um, see the, I'm not sure, the check the weather for. Well, hopefully it'll be nice weather this well. Mm. Well, it doesn't really matter because we will be inside mostly. But I like to do maybe a sky watch. We can. I mean, literally, oh, we've got Nap Hill, 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 Hill there, yeah. yeah, just down the road. So that's no excuse not to go there. All right, is Annalisa coming? Uh, that's she a good can... question, actually. Yeah, I think they might be. Oh, you know, so. Um, I can't wait to see them. I can't wait to meet all these people. It's just I miss them so much. Yeah, it's been so dismal to be away from them, everyone. It's like been... it's the meeting of the tribes again. Exactly. Yeah, uh, it really is. Oh, hey, we're gonna I'll show you. See how much more I can show you along here. But this is just such a lovely drive. I don't want to switch the ca camera off because it's yeah, such a beautiful like, drive here. Don't often. Uh, don't often. Yeah, this is what I've been looking forward to seeing. And there's no crop circles visible here, I don't think. I mean, um, there does seem to be quite a few, though, considering we're still yeah, a lot I mean, of lockdown. Yeah, there we could have. Um, uh, if you see, there would have been one. It was just off the um, just just before the stone, you know, eight three stone circle, the crop circle would be there. May something may have come down tonight, tomorrow. Who knows? Maybe we'll get a, a basis uh, crop circle or something. Well, you know, um, if Matthew Williams can get out of his sick bed and get his plank out, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Uh, no, he doesn't make them really. Oh yes, I do. I make them all. No, you don't. I mean, in fact, if you, you get do a video the other day, his first uh, video for a long time, uh, flying his drone over the one. Uh, um, uh, where is it? Uh, I forget what it's called now. Hackman oh. uh, Hill. Hackman Hill. Hackman Hill. Sorry. Yeah. Hackman Hill, yeah. Um, he, he did a, a video there because there was one that. 
Frank's it looks very much, and I didn't realise it until someone posted it, but there's a the barge, there's a t-shirt of the barge with me and Mars bought, and it's actually the same, it's like a target sign, I don't know if you've seen it, but and that's the same symbol that the barge used on their t-shirt, so I don't know if that's a, a good positive sign that obviously Mars is <coughs> a Venus at the bases uh, conference. Who knows? I mean this is like got it's got to get a lot of attention because I mean, this is the first proper UFO paranormal con um, government cover-up conference for so long in this country. It's the first live one, literally since RawCon in February last year. It's I mean, it's the first one I've been to. It's the first one anyone's been to, because if there'd been others, I'd have gone to them, believe me. I'd yeah. have gone to them. How about that? That's a lovely view for you. We were deprived of our probe, last ever probe. The, yeah, the fight, I was going to take you to the last ever probe, and I couldn't, because it was... Uh, well, the Lapis yeah. Conference is going ahead at some point. I don't know if it's this year, but uh, maybe this autumn there'll be a Lapis Conference. Again, are we relying on that? Yeah, oh, but I hope so. The lockdown. Yeah. Sure. There'll be another, I think there's going to be a weird weekend again. Um, I've already bought my ticket for that. But I told I told Glenn, I said, you keep, you know, keep it and transfer it to the next one. And he said, okay. Here we, there's that there is uh, Bishop Canning, I think, with that tall spire, that steeple there. And, uh, oh, we didn't, we didn't see the... Oh, we haven't, we haven't actually got to the bit where there's the, uh... Oh, well, we're nearly there, I think. But I must admit, it must be the other way, where you see the hills and you see... Of course, yeah, you see the city, don't you? The, the city hills and the, the the big obelisk. That's actually on the north... That's actually the northwest road, which is the southeast-west one. That's, that goes to Cal, this goes to Devices. I, I was getting my geography mixed up. But that is the, the equivalent on Sidonia of the city, There's the series of pyramids called the city. And you go to the DNM pyramid, that's where, that, that's where we've been on. You got, it goes to the south of the DNM pyramid, which is where you have that cluster of trees with a little tiny, the little like three foot monolith in it. Oh, well, we're nearly at Devices, guys. I think so. Well, we're going to. I think that's. We're yeah, a good. good we, session. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we videoed good. nearly the entire journey. So, uh, anyway, guys, it remains to me. All we have to do now, I think, is get to the to, to Miles' place. And then. Uh, we're, I'm sleeping on Miles' tea. Oh, every expense bear as well. Yeah, and Colin, you've got a nice room at the Bear Hotel, I believe. Yeah. Oh, all right. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so I'll three nights there, sleeping, one night at Miles'. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys, so see you later. Here's just a little, uh, this is the basis car park sign that Miles has made, which is very good. Basis at the Barge, 2021, July 9th, 10th, 11th. Edmund Marriage is first, then lunch. That's on Friday, it's a three day event. Jane Shattuck. Then Edmund Marriage 2 and Maria Wheatley 2. So there's three speakers on Friday, two of them are doing double, double bills. And then Saturday, Dave Hodrian. Be good to see him again. And Mike Oram on Zoom. Hope that works. And then some fella called Benjamin Jones, who's he? Never heard of him. Igor Witkowski, interesting chap. Learn a few things from him. And then on Sunday, Tony, Sir Tony of Toppingshire, number one. No, 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 sorry. Apologies, that is actually still Saturday. And then Sophia Green and Celestial Paladin, who's aka Duncan Davis, who's uh, recently done an interview with Miles. On Sunday, we've got Julie Phelps. Deborah Hatswell of British Bigfoot, Michael Shrimpton, the Germans did it, Remy Hall, Sir Tony of Toppingshire 2, Dr. Richard Fleming, and then England, oh of course then it's the football, <laughs> the football on, of course is going on Sunday evening, so yeah, got a great weekend ahead of us I think. Alright ladies and gentlemen, Panama TV viewers, we've, we're on the road to the barge, now um, we, you may remember this from my last visit. I'm here with Colin again, you see, and um, you may remember this from our last visit. But we, the barge is now open properly. Last time we came here, we had to sit in the garden. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. you, you, yeah, well, you must watch if you watch yeah, the video. Yeah. I'll put a link. You can see it. Um, but we sat in the garden, in the beer garden, and we had to order things from a from a little kiosk. Now, apparently, the pub is open properly. Um, probably there'll be the usual lockdown rules of price. I've got my subversive mask just so I can get through the door, but it says uh, it's got a QAnon thing on where we go one we go all. So there's no way I'm wearing an ordinary mask. If I'm wearing a, if I've got to wear a mask, I'm going to wear a subversive rebel mask. <laughs> but um, we're going to go there and um, have a have a bite. I'm, I'm curious to see what I'll have a bite to eat, maybe a pint, or yeah. rather the way around. Another freedom pint and maybe some food. Oh, and uh, I mean, if we don't get run over by a tractor on the way. 
Uh, Miles has gone ahead of us in the Miles Mobile with Gemma. Oh, it's starting to rain, Ben. It's not oh, now it's raining. Oh, now it's actually raining. really sunny yeah. a minute ago, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. it's just, uh... Not to worry. You know, um, Gemma, now Gemma is Jenny. I can give you her real name now. Her real name is Gemma. Um, her real name is Gemma Cooper, formerly a presenter at the BBC, now disgraced, but because she doesn't work for those bastards anymore, I can tell you who she is. She may be willing to appear on camera later. I'll see how she feels about that. But she's going to be a, she's going to be on Miles's uh, footage anyway because she is speaking at. Uh, she's going to be the master of ceremonies or mistress of ceremonies, along with um, this other lady, um, Remy. Remy, yeah. So yeah, that's a really nice. There's an old World War Two pillbox there as well. And these are the, this is the height, this is the range of hills where we go sky watching. Although we, we may not have time tonight, but hopefully we'll get some other time over the weekend. We'll have time to come here and have a sky watch. There's Hackben Hill, uh, Golden Ball Hill, Nap Hill, Hackben Hill, Milk Hill, etc. The highest points in Wiltshire. And you'll be familiar with these if you watch carefully, if you watch regularly. And we are now, this is, this is, isn't it lovely? This is just a, such a lovely place. This is the Vale of Pusey. Some interesting colours as well. Uh... And look at the sky, the sky is amazing. We're just getting some rain now, but it's still sunny over there. And there's some amazing cloud formations. And that, to me, this just makes it look more, it gives it more charm. Yeah, you never know. Mm. Good old English. I mean, I've been a bit, probably quite a bit of rain like we have in London the last couple of weeks. It hasn't been great. Yeah. It's probably good news to the crop circle makers, but uh, I think that'll improve their palette somewhat. Yeah. Rain. We'll, we'll find out later in the next few weeks. We'll see if any turn up tonight. Like I said, uh, my be I personally believe that uh, some crop circles, I'm not sure what the proportion is, are not made by plankers. They're actually made by the aliens or whatever they are. Um, I have the, you know, they actually do appear, literally appear. So we'll see. But, uh, can some, this is just, oh, I feel so. I feel so gooey and wonderful coming home to this. I just, it's like coming home. And the rain has started, but who cares? They can hear, hopefully you can hear the sound of rain. Yeah. I love the sound of rain when you're indoors or in a car or something, you don't have to worry about getting wet. It's just wonderful. Mmm, yeah. Being one with nature, look at that, look at that sky. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, so, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have thought it was, was going to rain actually, because when we were sitting out, uh, about five minutes ago, it was like mm. quite sunny and nice. Miles has actually done his house up a bit. He's now got a decking in his front garden. So you can actually sit in the front. Off the porch, yeah. You yeah. Can sit there and you can talk. And it's great because we were like talking, we were talking like woo woo stuff. And Miles came up, he says, Keep your voices down, keep your voices down. And I suddenly realised we didn't want to make him more of a pariah with the neighbours than he already is. <laughs> so we agreed. If they could have brought a banjo, we could have played on the porch, like, <laughs> yeah. in the delivery, <laughs> you know? We could have played all kinds yeah. of, like, um, new anti-New World Order songs, you know, like, um, um, Strange Looks in the Night, or something like that. <laughs> oh, my God, you want to be riding a bike today. No, actually, I don't know if the cyclists down this road, actually, mm. but... Um, it must be hospital port. Well, you were up that hill that time where it was raining. We, we, no, you were there, weren't you? Yeah, we went up there with. with was Sherry there? Yeah, we went up with um, loads of people. Uh, there was, I can't yeah. remember everyone was there, but you and I and Miles that and was, um, we went. That was a great getaway, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, and the weather was, was a bit. Yeah, it was. It was a bit. It was a bit rubbish. It but, was um, really wet. But we, it was so wonderful. I just had such. We, we went all the way down these hills and up the next steep side, didn't we? Do you remember? <laughs> Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, well, funny thing is, I didn't mean to go back there, but I uh, haven't mm. really, because we didn't really achieve, I didn't think we actually went, what was the name of the hill? We, we had to go up um, Tan Hill. Tan Hill. We right. never got to go up Tan Hill, yeah. it was getting too wet and we decided to go back, but maybe that would be nice to do that, wouldn't it, to go up Tan Hill as well. You'll see that white horse in a moment, and we'll see the, the, the famous white horse, it's over there. Which, when you see that white horse, you know we're close to the barge. But I'll put links in the description box to the last Great Escape, and also maybe, there it is, and also maybe the one before. But you can click the links to the one before successively, once you've watched each one. And um, enjoy, enjoy our last, our, our last adventures in this part of the world. And it's like really, um, it's really something else. So Colin, I think we're nearly there. We're gonna, it's, it's actually over there, you can see it over there. We're gonna have a, a freedom pint, or, or two, or three, as the Irish say. 
and then maybe some food as well so looking forward to that we're back this is the barge as it is now there's people in the beer garden no doubt there'll be people inside as well i hope we can go inside yeah well you guys will recognize this if you've watched my previous videos this mural here in the pool room it's still here it has not been obliterated i heard it had been just whitewashed and it hasn't i think that would have been a crime against art quite frankly if it had so look still there that's great news that's great finally uh, yeah ladies and gentlemen i mean this is a beautiful sunset here we're driving back from the barge we, we you've just seen we've had a meal we've had a pint we saw some friends such as julie who's a speaker and mark who's another delegate i mean with colin it's crazy and there's a lady here. in the back you might have been can i put you in the frame yeah, yeah. um do you, do you recognize this lady <laughs> if you watch bbc if you watch the bbc you'll probably know this lady i'm a disgraced ex-bbc yes. presenter yeah. who got caught going on anti-lockdown marches and oh now, naughty now i don't work for the bbc anymore my choice and yeah. I'm free to be the person I was always meant to be, free to be part of the new human paradigm, moving from a 3D to a 5D dimension, the part of the new age reality. That's where we are now. Oh, excellent. The Wiltshire landscape. Amen. I bet you'd love to have seen her say, say that on the news, yes. <laughs> Gemma, uh, Gemma Cooper was, you may, if you read these trashy newspapers, you'll know that she has been done, she's done a David Icke, and uh, she's now out of the BBC fold. Um, so you, you won't see her on the small screen anymore, but you will see her at much better places such as conferences like this. And so Gemma, it's great. Uh, this is the lady I called Jenny, and I, did, I protected your identity because I knew something like this would happen to you. Well, we've known each other a really long time, Ben, mm -hmm. on the alternative scene, and I, I really tried to keep my two worlds secret. I had one foot in one camp and one foot in another camp, which is never sustainable. Yeah. And you called me Jenny for all that time, and you protected me, which I was really pleased about. But now I'm free to be the person I was always meant to be. And funny enough, it's worked out for the best, because not only am I now on Hapanwo, but I've been on Richie Allen's show, I've been on iconic with Gareth Icke and new doors in the alternative world are opening for me all because I was courageous enough to step away from that mainstream media world and um, frightening though it was I've never been happier excellent that's so that's what if you're ever faced with that kind of choice fortune favors the bold don't uh, don't do what they don't what is it David Icke says you can do what's right or you can do what you're told <laughs> yeah and uh, Je Gemma decided to do what was right as did I as did David and uh, I'm, I'm happy around the NHS now, to be honest. And uh, so it's great. Uh, it's great to uh, welcome you back into the um, open of, as yourself in this community. Jen, That's myself, Jen, yeah, Jen, the Jen, real me. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, we've had a lovely evening. I've, I've, Colin and I and, and Gemma uh, have been talking to Julian and Mark and Miles. Few suspicious characters. Yeah, a few suspicious characters. You'll be seeing more of them. Um, and we're now heading back to Devices. We're going to have a little drink and then probably go to bed. Because it's a big day tomorrow. It's the first day of the conference. I'm not speaking till Saturday. I'm hosting but, it. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Gemma is going to be the MC along with worth, um, worth the attendance, with Remy. The attendance, so <laughs> mm, yeah, that's really good. Oh, it's great. I mean, it's like, um, it, I'm so looking forward to it. I know it's going to be such a big day. And Saturday, of course, I'm speaking. I'm glad I'm not speaking tomorrow, actually. I, I, I'd like to sort of assimilate the atmosphere before I start speaking. But I've worked on my uh, my talk, and um, I will be recording it, oh, the audio. Miles will do a, like a proper recording of this. And um, yeah, um, I feel like it's wonderful to be here. Look at the sky. Just look at the sky. Shepherd's delight. Mm. Yeah, shepherd's delight. It's just angel delight, my friend. It's almost like <laughs> <laughs> I used to have an mm. angel delight when I was a kid. I, I liked it when I was a kid. I couldn't eat it now. <laughs> no, maybe not. But look at it. It's just like. A mountain range in the distance. It's, it's otherworldly. It yeah, you it expect does. to see a UFO yeah, pop up at any do. point. You know, this is not well, a manifest one. Like, yeah, like a manifest one. Yeah. It's such a beautiful landscape. It's such an ethereal yeah, place. It is. Yes, and the sky makes it even look even more so. Oh, it's been it's been wonderful to sit in that barge. Like I missed I missed the original barge, and I'm back again. And it's just it's like a nostalgic dream come true. And to sort of sit around and talk about things. Which I can't talk about with normally. As as Mark says, you know, I want to be with my tribe. Yeah. I know I am, and I'm happy. Yeah. So. Oh, what a wonderful evening. Happy memories, guys. Yeah. Oh, a good. Go, 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 go. Sure, that, that wasn't me. That was. <laughs> I didn't make that noise. That was that reprobate there. Good morning, everyone. It is a Friday. It is the 9th of July, and this is the first day of the Basis Project Conference. I went to the pub last night with the, with Gemma and Colin, and met up with Tony, our other friend. 
Uh, we had a good time. We met some guy. Um, some bloke who's sort of on our wavelength. And Gemma's sort of like quite good at sort of talking to strangers and things. So we kind of... That was quite interesting. Although I was, I was like dropping off to sleep. I'm going to have to... I'll probably be... I'm not really a night owl sort of person. Um, and this evening I'd... I won't be able to have too much to drink this evening, and I might even have to come home early to to work on my talk for tomorrow because um, because we've got like uh, I've got to like prepare it and everything. So uh, that's uh, looking forward to seeing today's speakers: Edmund Marriage. Um, who else? I think Maria's doing a talk today. Uh, so um, well, I'll go through I'll we'll go through it when we get there. So at the moment, just having breakfast and a cup of tea. I'll show you something interesting. Miles has a, a tea cup here. It's a mole coffee mug, whatever, and it's got this. I can't speak German, but you this sure? sounds like you know, this sounds like this um, theory by this Russian guy whose name I can't remember to explain the World Trade Center. It's written on the front of the bloody mug. Oh, nine eleven memorial for kids. Dot org. There was a nuclear bomb under the World Trade Center. Explain the the collapse and dustification of the building. Problem is with that is that um there's no noise. Um even though there is like effects of radiation, there's no noise. Hence the new Hiroshima. Also where's the hole? You get a big hole if you had if you detonated a nuke underground. The uh, the bathtub would, would split, as you see here the bathtub breaks. And then all the water from the River Hudson would rush in. Pour right down on top of the fireball, you get a huge cloud of steam like you're doing these underwater nuclear explosions at um, places like Bikini. And um, that didn't happen. And you'd, you'd end up with a huge, big, giant lake of boiling radioactive water, which of course didn't happen. I think Dr. Judy Wood is right about the nuclear. Nuclear, um, about uh, the World Trade Center. But anyway, so I don't know where Miles got this. If anyone speaks German, they can tell me what this means. Uh, yeah. Well, hello there. We're sitting in the official basis project garden, me and Colin there. Now, you'll remember this from the last time we were here. Um, but we've been having breakfast, we've been studying the news headlines, and we've been watching some old videos, Colin. Yes. What's, um, who, what's the old videos? Oh, it was um, Town TV who. Uh Based in Andover, they used to. Um, it was back in '95. There was like, I think cable TV was quite big then. That's because it all kind of started, maybe a few years, a couple of years before that. But um, uh, Andover, they had their own TV show called Town TV. And what was interesting was um, Reg Presley, who uh, you may know as being, and in few, he was in the band of Trogs and um, did well thing. Love is all around. In the early 90s, he got really into the whole crop circle and UFO subject, and in fact, the alien autopsy subject. And um, what's interesting is you can actually see some of his um, original shows, which featured on Town TV. It was like a, a UFO um, uh, segment, or, or it may have been separate from Town TV, I'm, I'm not sure. But um, he had his own show anyway, Reg. And um, so, what was, what was good was they just uploaded literally videos today from. That period in 1995, with um, when you know the alien autopsy came out, so that was interesting, and it actually had a there's a video you can watch of Ray Santilli in his office, which is quite rare because there's not much footage actually of that time period with Ray and um, Colin Andrews features in all the f all these videos as well. There's a few other videos where um, there's a I think there's a Professor Chang comes over from Taiwan, um, in, you know, because there's a quite strong interest, and Taiwan sort of like. Um, to, I guess was it part of China originally? Yeah. It was, but it's it's like a broke. It's a bro it's a little island off the coast of China, yeah. which is nominally independent, although China claims it as its right. own. Yeah. You know. A lot of people are saying that that's potential of a possible war, or it's almost happened a few times. Yeah. Like, it's a bit like over Hong Kong. It's mm. sort of, I think it's like one of those disputed sort of things of the um, yeah. probably the communist you know the Chinese Communist Party would like. Taiwan to uh, I think know, yeah under, it could, under their uh, own rules and uh, they're always coveting it yeah but what, you know the, I like the the debate because Colin Andrew gets oh, into yeah. a debate with Doug and Dave on a TV yeah, show there's, there's, um, we were looking at that other clip but I think Colin had uploaded on his his Facebook a couple of days ago and it was it's rare a rare debate which must have been around ninety one I believe because that's I think when Doug and Dave's story came out and uh, they didn't want to debate Colin on the stage so they said they wouldn't appear so they had to 
um, replace him actually on the day, but Colin was went on in the audience. And what was interesting <laughs> yeah. was there was a um, big bunch of skeptics from Southampton University, and it it's only like a two minute clear, but Colin says he's going to upload it at some point in the future. But oh. it's very interesting because it was one of those early debates back in the early nineties where you know it was it was really kicking off yeah. in quite a big way because it was such a huge thing, uh, especially with Doug and Dave on there. It was, yeah. So it's interesting. Um, but yeah, we watched, and so that was, and there was another clip, um, Dan, Danbury Ring, which is again near Andover, and some of the crop circles there. These profess, this professor from China, Dr. Cha, um, from Taiwan, and I think he took an interest in the alien autopsy stuff as well. So it was just interesting to see. I mean, that was God, 26, 26 years ago. Now. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's, it's yeah. amazing, um, but um, yeah. it's worth checking out. Yeah, I've got, I must, I must actually admit that I. Um I fell for the Doug and Dave hoax in the early 90s. So I, was, I was just sort of getting getting into this. In the so at some point, around about 1990, um, there was a massive crop circle craze in this in this country, and they were, it was in every newspaper. Everyone was crazy about them. And then um, that was when Doug and Dave came along, and they dropped. Oh, it's all it was us all along. And I watched that, and unfortunately, I believed it. It was only years later I, I saw Andy Thomas on the Esther show, Esther Ranson's program. And um, I realised, oh God, is this still going on? What's, what's this? And I suddenly realised I'd been fooled. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, that was very, very interesting. Also, uh, of course, that was very interesting stuff, Colin. Also, we um, we're in a situation now. Where in two days' time, England are going to be in the European Cup final. Now, this is the this is the most successful, the biggest success they've had since the '66 World Cup final, and everyone's really excited because, to be honest, I mean, England have had some. England have deserved this. They've had some terrible bad luck. And I'm speaking as a Welsh boy now. But um, there's a lot of talk about um, a, you know, aliens not ruining the party, so to speak. Some, in the sun, of course, it seems to have gone back to its traditional sort of more sort of witty and um, sort of quirky style rather than the old sort of, you know, redneck kind of table thumping style. Um, what have they been saying, Cole? Well, no, I think that was the Daily Star. To be fair, I think Daily Star far exceeds anything because they literally have it on the front page nearly every every day. Yeah? Mm. But it was so I don't know what the story was going to do with farting aliens, wasn't there? there was, uh, we never saw the one about the farting aliens, boy. Um, we saw about, please, they said to us, please don't mess up the, please aliens, please do not mess up the, the final at Wembley. Oh, that but, was for the um, semi final. Like yeah, the picture I showed you, that was just before the semi final, so yeah. that was an older one. But, um, yeah, it seems like they seem to shoot all night. Aliens and football into into all these um, yeah. fun and it's, it's it's interesting that they feature on the front page quite a lot. There's but, been uh, several interesting. Um Photos. I mean, there was one. There was a photo published. Unfortunately, it's a picture of the moon that has been sort of like messed with, messed with. But there's another one from the United States, which appears to show a structured craft with a partly yeah. orange, partly yellow, with some like what looks like lights or windows on it. It's very interesting. Yeah, it was in Wisconsin. That was the uh, mm. 13th of June. It's um, yeah, very interesting. If you can check it out, uh, mm. it's on. Uh, well, it's actually, you can see it. I've put a link on my page, uh, yeah. autopsy analysis. If you're interested, you'll find it there. But it's like four still photos, but it certainly looks like. Um, actually, you can show a picture of it there, actually. Maybe, I'm not sure if it's going to. I'm trying to zoom in on it. Let me just. Look at the red bits. That's it, yeah. That, that, that is, that's quite an amazing image. If that's real, and of course, you always got to ask yourself the question nowadays whether it's real or not, but. Um, it was. Yeah. Like, yeah, four stills, and. Um, that's quite something, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to know more about that, yeah. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, so aliens do not mess with the football. Well, Don't I mean, fart above Wembley Stadium. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at the headlines and apparently the rumours that should we win the cup then possibly bank Monday might be a bank holiday, which would seem like, well, I think that'd be pretty short notice, but, um, you know, because I'm, I'm off mm. that day anyway, so it doesn't really affect me. But yeah, I'll be, I'll be on my way home that day, but, um, yeah, but uh, Sunday night will be... It's, Watching, uh, watching it on Miles's big screen TV. It's a good way to sort of like have a little bit of a party at the end of the conference, where we're normally sort of on the come down. Yeah. Uh, we have we've got the football to watch, which is something. And England, you know, England deserve this. Um, they've had some terrible bad luck over the years. It's not to say they're not going to have some bad luck in the final day. Exactly. Yeah. So, but you know, yeah. But yeah, I mean, still, they, you know, that's. Well, someone has to lose at the end of the day, so it's either going to be England or Italy. I think that's. The I same. don't think they have. Well, one thing that's good, I think in a final, you don't. At least I know in the World Cup final, you don't have penalty shootouts. It could be different for the European Cup, but um, penalty shootouts. Of course, England has a bit of a. 
it's, it's a bit of a, a curse when it comes to England. I think England are generally quite a cursed team. You know, you had the cheating of Diego Maradona in the 86 World Cup. Uh, there's been other examples of just, just it feels like, you know, the, 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 the dice comes down wrong, the coins come down wrong, and uh, it's, it's really bad because England do have the skill I think to win. Yeah, I mean they've got. But they just need them. On, on paper, they've got the players. If you put, we're well, not an expert on all the Italian players. I mean, but they've definitely got some good players there. But you'd say on paper that, and they, and on the substitutes bench as well, they've got a lot of good oh. talent they can bring on. But um, I'm sure it'd be a tense affair. I'm not really um, sure how it's going to go. But at the end of the day, that'll be it'll be, you know, after the, the base is, is finished. So it'll be a good way to unwind. Like, I guess if you can. If you can, I'm one. <laughs> but I'm, I'm sure we'll have a few drinks and yeah. whatever happens. We'll, well, we've got yeah. like, um, I know, I've, I know um, Tino, our, our friend who works with Gary Heseltine and Larry Warren, he's, he's Italian, so, uh, but he lives in England. Well, <laughs> to be fair, a lot of us aren't actually English. No, there's hardly anyone who's actually English. Yeah, I'm not even uh, fully English. And then obviously Ben, you're not. Yeah. And then um, we've got Miles, he's not. Uh, mm. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's um, we sort of. But I, I, I will be, I will be sort of supporting uh, England in this one mm. anyway. So, and it would be good to sort of have that sort of feel-good spirit. But um, yeah, I, I would avoid all the pubs, to be honest, with because regardless of what happens, it could get a bit messy in there. Yeah. England lose, things could be, you know, could be literally right. <laughs> it's you know, because yeah. you know, if only people could be as passionate about these other subjects that we're interested in as 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 you know, football, because you know, I'm sure we wouldn't be going through all this tyranny and, and what we've experienced over the last year. Yeah, that's a good point actually because I mean I um, as much as I understand the passion of sport um, there's so much real things going on. I mean think, I say real I mean um, things real affect yeah, us on a, on a serious, definite I mean, level serious issues fix, yeah right? that we could um, like football. yeah I think the UFO and conspiracy and paranormal stuff is kind of my equivalent to football. You know, I think it's in my life. It, it plays the role that it does in some other guys' lives as with football. But, uh, but God, I think we're going to have to head off soon, aren't we? Yeah, yeah we're, we're going to have to pick up the Fred Tony. Yeah, and, uh, it's now. Uh, I think door seven ten thirty. Yeah, we're just sitting here. We're going to, we're going to head off because we've been sitting here for a few minutes now, and it's been nice. But I'm sure we'll have another chance to sit in this garden. And uh, enjoy the blue sky. Not a chemtrail well, in sight. The last day of the sunshine. Oh well, the forecast is not good. But the forecast was wrong about yesterday. They yeah. said showers and there was none. So hopefully it's wrong for the rest of the weekend. But um, whatever you're doing, guys, uh, I hope you enjoy the weekend. And uh, come on, England! This is the main street in Devizes here. We're underneath this rather sort of ecclesiastical-looking memorial. Funny thing about the streets, I can never work out which end I'm at. The Swan, the, the, the Swan where we had the conference at Christmas is at that end. And you come along here, and there's the Bear Hotel over there. Colin is just, uh, he's just getting some, uh, he's just getting a ticket for, we've got to pay to use this car park. We're just picking someone up. Uh, Tony, is a, he's, he's a complete Luddite. Refuses to use a mobile phone or anything like that. So, uh, he's, uh, we've just got to, Sort of beat him at certain places at certain times, you know. Reminds me of my granddad. There you go. There's a Ronnie Yu film here, I can I can imagine at this point. Honey Street, we're almost at the barge. I'm sitting in the back seat for a change. Uh, we're just gonna go into the into the barge in. And um, this is the little lane that leads up there. Uh, Sorry guys, we're just doing a little carry on, it's right, I'm just my little vlog here. Okay. Um, and there's a cafe you can actually breakfast. I've already had breakfast, but uh, look wagon, at that. The this wagons is... are rolling into the barn. Yeah. You always manage another breakfast. Yeah, I'm like a hobbit, you know, I can have second breakfast. And here, isn't it lovely? The Hot Crop Circle Museum, which you saw in my last video here, oh, is just over here, over in this direction. And the pub itself is just going to run here. As a camper van arrives, I think somebody is um, planning on staying. The, you saw the campsite. I didn't show you the campsite yesterday, but it's really quite, quite incredible. Julie, Julie Phelps is staying there. I saw Julie yesterday. And Mark, our friend Mark from Nottingham, is staying there in a yurt. He's got a luxury yurt. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and uh, I think, so ooh, I think there's a few bumps along here to keep the parking on there. the left today where the, where, the, where the camping vans go. Yeah, we, we've got a different car park today. But isn't it, this is just so like, 
you, you've got to be here to sense the atmosphere, ladies and gentlemen. You really do. I can't convey the feeling you get when you're in a place like this. Um, I know Gareth Davis, who's in Los Angeles, so it's a bit of a long distance journey for him. Um, yeah, but it's like, oh, look at this. Look at that huge tent at the bush. I think that might be Mark Yurt. Ah. I don't know. He's. It looks like. Um, no, no, not that. No, that's the marquee. <laughs> they are playing. There's a band there later. Ah, so, it is a festival. Here we are, guys. So, let's, uh, looking forward to meeting everyone. Here is the new annex to the pub, which is where our venue is. And that there is a lovely sculpture. Looks like a metallic sculpture of the famous 2002 Milk Hill formation. How many, Tony? How many circles were in that? There were like a, a was it 200 plus circles in that? 404. 404 circles. Yeah. This is almost like a third of a mile across. It's, uh, it was made in, on a wet night in, in August 2002 and no footprints anywhere. No. Quite something. Um, we're now, Colin and I are now sitting in the basis project. This is the, this is the venue you can see here. There's Miles. Miles has just done an introduction. We have Edmund Marriage coming on in a minute. There's the wonderful the thing that Miriam designed there on there on the on the, the barge. Um, I might just use that as a still actually. And then over here it's like uh, the, the podium, the standard thing you're all familiar with. Hey Colin, we're on the second row. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. Probably get, uh, just because we were restricted a bit further back. Mm. We usually like to go further back, but um, no, it's all good. It's I've, all got good. A, I've kind of got a bottom in front of me at the moment, so it's a bit distracting. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm, um, I don't want to go see. I sometimes get a bit drowsy at events like this, and I don't want the speaker to think. I just wanted the speaker to know. It's not because the speaker's boring. It's just I always get drowsy at these events, and I just do. It's just. I think to do with the ten pints consumed the previous night. I'm sure that is irrelevant. Yeah, I'm not sure it's irrelevant. But um, yeah, it's the, the conference is about to start. The first day of this three-day event, and got, um, got a piano there, Ben. You could be uh, knocking out a tune later. Oh yeah, I can, well, I would, if I could, I would. Yeah, yeah. but I yeah, can. I'll sing bass, a song and do the bass song. Someone can accompany me as, you know, as, as I sing a song. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, this is, and we're, that is what you saw from the other side, that, that sculpture there of the Milk Hill 2002 formation in this lovely new venue here. I'll just give you a quick 360, yeah? Oh, it's really nice, isn't it? Oh, uh, there's Alice. Hello, Alice. <laughs> Alice is here. That was a nice surprise actually seeing Alice. <laughs> yeah. So well, we're looking forward to today very much indeed. I just finished watching Edmund Marriage. This, um, there was a interesting talk, but set with technical problems and we had to break off halfway through because of the scheduling. But he talks about um, the ancient origins of humans and civilization. It's very, very interesting. Um, he talks about the Christian and Barbara Joy O'Brien, who are a couple who uh, research these things. For example, um, there's the, the Atlantis. I mean, everyone wonders where Atlantis is. Apparently, it was in the Azores. It was beyond the pillars of Hercules, like you've always said. Um, there's all kinds of books, such as The Shining Ones, The Genius of the Few, uh, The Megalithic Odyssey, www.goldenageproject.org.uk. Also, this is really interesting. All these traditional ancient measurements, like the Megalithic Yard, uh, the Royal Cubit, for example, the megalithic yard was used in Europe um, in the third millennium BC, and, and the royal cubit was used in Egypt in the, during the same period. Yet, this this research has discovered Edmonds's research has discovered there are actually two versions of the same measurement, which indicates that these these cultures had contact with each other, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, Edmund talks about the uh, genetic the genetic um, background to humans, and he's apparently all. There's um, about how it all, there's some to talk about how, about the origins of humans. I mean, the, he does support the, the original method. It was all, it's the out of, out of Africa hypothesis. And there's a, a creature, there's a, a being, like it's a Homo sapiens idali, which is like an, a new species, subspecies from Africa, 160,000 BC, which we're all descended from. Um, he mentions the Long Skull people as well, which was the dwarf one from Maria Wheatley. Kennewick Man, that's very interesting. Kennewick Man was found at the Columbia River, Washington State, USA. Um, it's a, from about 30,000 years ago, yet it's not an Amerindian. He's, uh, he was a, had some European features, very interesting. 
Um, there were Europeans in America from 30,000 years ago. There's stone tools like the Clovic, Clovis uh, Neolithic stone tools, cave paintings. So that was in the that was in the North America and Europe at the same time. Cave paintings in Europe, megalithic sites in North America of the type you get in Europe, and um, in Shatelhoy at Turkey, there's images of DNA. It's incredible. Um, what happens is probably civilization goes through cycles based on astronomical events such as cometary impacts and ray and rays of galactic cosmic rays that affect the Earth at regular periods as the Earth orbits the galaxy. Um, very interesting stuff. Um, I remember him. There he is. No, that's, that's Edmund. No, going the way. I remember him from Probe. Um, he did a talk at Probe a long time ago, and I didn't recognise him because he used to have a beard. But uh, yeah, but he's going to get Miles. Is going to let him have a. Miles, Miles had to cut him off halfway through, but he's going to be allowed to continue after. Obviously, you know, it's just the delays in the schedule. I'm at the barge. You can't beat being outside the barge in this beautiful beer garden in nice weather. I mean, literally, there's no finer place on earth than this location. I'll just show you up top. Hello, Maria. Hiya. How you doing? Oh, hello. You all right? How you doing? Yeah, yeah not bad. Well. Good, good. I'm just doing a bit of videoing at the moment. I'm just showing everyone the... That's Maria Wheatley there. You Hi. may know her. Hi. <laughs> that's, that's Tina. I'm my other friend, Tina. Um, they're just showing everyone this divine little spot here. And you can actually see the view behind us. There's the big hills. So, yeah, we're really having fun here. Yeah, we just uh, had our, we had our lunch, and now we just listened to the second speaker of the day, Maria Wheatley. Um, quite something that was. Um, firstly, she mentioned she found another star child. Oh, who's that? Some weird bloke behind me. That's yeah. it. It's Mark. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, she found like another star child, but she'll say more about that some later on. But she talked today about the megaliths and the moon. Hi, Ellis. Hi. And, um, and the fact is that um, a lot of the you see, we, we, a lot of the uh, archaeology is centred around the idea that these are solar temples, but Maria thinks the moon is very much involved as well, like the Cavendish site in Scotland, which is pretty much intact, unlike most of the others. Um, it's very, there's a very sort of sensual feminine element to the way the moon travels across the landscape and things like that. And um, again, this ties into what she said before about the long headed people. Sure, right, Marie. No, like, no, no. About the, the long headed people and the moon and how the, the megalithic sites actually have been built in several phases. Um, and you see that the moon moves different. The moon moves different to, to the sun, but of course it's the second most prominent thing in the sky. And um, Maria and several other several people have commented on this about how the sun represents masculine energy and the the moon feminine. That's a, that's a possibility. I mean, certainly with Kalanish, there's a there's a feminine element to the to the symbolism of the other side and the movement. Of the moon. I'm miles away right now. If you talk to Edmund Marriage's wife here, she'd sell, she would take all the money off you you want and you can get a book sometime next century. And, and um, the other publisher of books that you can get is that woman called Maria Wheatley. She's got books available as well. Uh, uh, Jane Shannon attend. Yeah. And um, Sorry. Now, um, the examples she points out that the hinges, the stone circles, are not all circles. Um, and they're not all hinges either, because a hinge has to have a, a, dip, a, a ditch inside rather than outside. But um, stone hinge like, has a ditch outside. But um, they're, they're someone's built in a series of arcs. And um, the archaeologist, the traditional sort of, so the academic response to this is, oh, there were different teams working together and they, they, they made mistakes because they were working from different plans. <laughs> like, they're stupid. I mean, <laughs> Imagine if modern builders did that, you'd have a house that's completely wonky. <laughs> and these things are far more um, precise than modern buildings. Um, and um, so, no, the, the, the arcs were put in there by deliberately, and it's to do with the met met uh, metonic cycle, that's to do with the moon. And there's also a connection to aquifers, that's very interesting. They're all built with a lot of aquifers. Aquifers are where there's large, there's underground lakes or or, or water-bearing minerals beneath the, the ground. You've heard a lot about aquifers because um, uh, Mama Gaddafi in Libya was planning to use the aquifers to irrigate the land under, underneath the Sahara Desert. 
void removed <laughs> in, a, in a coup. Yeah. Um, there's also optical effects <coughs> with these things because you see originally these stone circles look very different to what they do now. I mean, it's, they, they're amazing things to behold, but they're very old. I mean, they're between four and five thousand years old and they've deteriorated with time. They've been worn down by rain and wind and other things. They're, but originally, like we see, we think of them as like rather rough, lumpy, mish, you know, irregular stones on built on grass. But they weren't. They were originally much more precisely carved and shaped. And they were. It's quite like the grass was cleared off, and they were. And they, they were. They were like on bare chalk. So there's a huge white enclosure, and you'd have like what they call caustic. So it's an optical effect, rather like rainbows. It would have been really quite something to. to really quite an amazing thing. I mean, I, I look, looked at an article just a couple of days ago, interestingly, about um, the pyramids, about the pyramids of Egypt. They originally looked far more spectacular than they do today, because when they were first built, they had light, white limestone cladding covering them, which was, you can see the remains of it on the Kefren pyramid at the top. This covered the entire pyramid, it was smooth, all the edges were sharp, it was polished. The capstone ended in a point, and they'd have been really an amazing, huge, imagine a huge white perfect tetrahedron or a pyramid. I mean, it would have been what we're looking at today with the, with the, with the stone blocks is simply the masonry, it's the underlying masonry, which is what's left. And Stonehenge and Avery, places like that, are pretty similar. Um, and it's been it's been rearranged. A stone sixty. This one split. People say, "Oh, look, it's made of concrete, and it's got concrete." And that's because it people moved it around. It split. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, Maria thinks there was a cover-up in the 1950s over the true nature of the pyramid of the of Stonehenge. Um, the reasons for this, I'm not sure. Um, there's ways to interpret it. You know, the suppression of feminine energy and things like that. You hear a lot about. Um, that's a, that may be it, but um, it may have something else. It may have something to do with the suppression of the law, the existence of the long skull people. But it appears there's also areas that have never been in, excavated. They've always been left. There's never been permission to excavate them. So if someone's scared, what they might find there. Um, see, what she means is like the long skull people built the first Stonehenge, which was moon based, and then the round skull people, that is us, our, our species, built the. Phase two Stonehenge, which is the one which we're familiar with, which is sun-based. Also, it was, Silbury Hill might have originally been a cone, not had, without a flat top. It was then after the Norman Conquest, the flat top was removed because it was used as a lookout post during uh, during uh, civil wars. Um, but it originally had like a, a complete cone, and it would again it would have no grass on it. It would have been like pure chalk. Can you imagine that? And it's possible that it was it used to glow in the dark. Because it, you'd, get, you'd get like electricity, static electricity building up within it during certain periods when they with the groundwater. It, it may be connected to orgone energy as well, I'm not sure. Well, Nick, Nick Hayes would know a lot about that. And then you get like electrical discharges which will make it glow blue. It will actually, you get a blue glow over it, rather like St. Elmo's fire, which you get on ships at sea. And um, she showed a photograph someone had taken of Silbury Hill which shows this blue. Arc, this blue um, light above it, and it looks like a dragon actually. It looks it reminds me of one of Ellis Taylor's photographs. Ellis is here, of course, which is a nice surprise. Um, and she talks about uh, the connection to Gaia. The Gaia is the, the spirit of the earth, based on the Greek goddess Gaia, the spirit of the earth, and um, how we have this thing called the Vivaxis, which is, connects us to where we are at a certain point when we're born, like where we are when we're born. Um, the minerals in our bones and everything else about us is connecting access to that area, in my case West Wales, in Maria's case London. But she was saying that the royal family apparently use the Vivaxis energies probably for their own Illuminati rituals and things like that. For example, they're born often low in low land and they live high up. For example, Balmoral is 700 feet above sea level, but um, London is like 100 feet above sea level, things like that. Anyway. And that was, I think it's going to be more complicated because they're building a tunnel under Stonehenge. I talked about that before, and no doubt this will come up again. But that was very interesting indeed. So thanks very much, Maria Wheatley. I um, look forward to, to part two. I'll say more about these uh, particular... Um, I'll do like a, a debrief with Colin later, and we'll say more about these things. Um, right, we just finished uh, watching Jane Shattuck, uh, who's that very elegant, well-spoken lady there. Um, and she did a very, very interesting uh, talk there. And um, 
yeah, it was like she started like on reincarnation and, and things like that. And she, she, this is a speciality of hers where she talks about um, about how you know you go from one physical life to another to another. And she, <laughs> she talks about the the chakra system in which is basically the what connects the soul to the to the physical body. Very interesting stuff. I didn't know this, but there's chakras in your nose apparently. It's just like um like a model model of your little model of your body in your nose. It's like very strange because um, I've heard about having in your ear. I know that some and there's also reflexologists who who believe that um there's a chakra system in your feet. And by massaging your feet it actually affects your entire uh, body. However, I, I learned an off the most interesting part is when she started to well she mentioned so I'll go into the pineal gland. She mentions the pineal gland and about how it works best with children. That's because of calcification. Your pineal gland eventually stops working because it becomes full of, of calcium. Basically lime scale. It's like a washing machine or something, it's full of lime scale. And do you know what increases? And now Jane never mentioned this, but I'm sure she realised this. What um, increases calcification of the pineal gland is fluoride. And then she went on to listening, uh, reading something that was channeled to a friend of hers um, about the spirit world and about the description of it. And it's quite surprising. It's a very beautiful place. It's like a city with parks and things like that. But a soul who went there, he, he was actually a soldier in World War II, he, he found it very boring. There's not a lot to do. You, you can read. There are libraries where you can read. There's parks where you can wander around. Um, you wear these strange clothing that makes you feel like you're always wearing a dressing gown. But your electric body is very vulnerable to injury. I mean, you can injure yourself. And it's very, very painful. You have to go to a hospital. Um, there are rules as well. You're not allowed to pick the flowers in the park because the flowers are essentially souls of flowers ready to incarnate on Earth. And everyone in, all the, everyone in the spirit world wants to do is they queue up and they queue up and queue up wanting to get another physical life. And this guy said he'll go anywhere, he'll become a slave or a laborer or something, he'll go anything, he'll do anything to reincarnate back on the earth. That's interesting. Um, although of course there may be more than one spirit world, not maybe not every spirit world is like that, but and it's, it's not necessarily a, a paradise, but interesting stuff. Could you listen to the second talk by Edmund Murray? It's interesting stuff. I mean, he, talks about the, uh, the car sag epics, which is where you get the legend of the Garden of Eden. Um, which is, which, I've always not talked to lots, read other authors who talk about things like that. Um, but basically there's a, there's a place in Nepal. Where is Nepal? Is it Iraq? Uh, it's a place called Nepal. Uh, yeah, it's in Lebanon. I think it's in Lebanon, Lebanon, yeah. Where, it is where basically there were some civilizations that started right at the end of the Ice Age and you know, late 9th millennium, early 9th millennium BC, things like that. And um, this was in the Levantine Rift, which is uh, the area that goes through the Lebanese mountains, right through uh, the River Jordan and up to the, the Gulf of Kaaba and Russia, basically right through the Holy Land. And um, there's watercourses, wells, sophisticated settlements like Jericho. We all know the story about the walls of Jericho. Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down, you know. He, with the, he blew the trumpets and things like that. Which, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> they have lime fertilizer as well. Domesticated seeds, the same one we use today, wheat. Maize, barley, all domesticated, very different to their wild varieties. And um, it's believed that this was, there was a cometary impact in the Indian Ocean, 6500 BC, which caused climate change, it caused a, a tsunami, and that ruined, that destroyed it. And maybe Edmund thinks we should learn to protect ourselves from things like that. And he ended up by saying how, you know, a lot of ideas about how humans can be good instead of bad. I uh, mean, in, in an age, and he asked himself, how do we do that? Because in this age, the concepts of good and bad are hardly even recognised. We are essentially moral, a moral nihilistic society. And um, that's a good question. And in my talk tomorrow, I hope to answer some of those questions.
Well, the first day at the base of the Barge conference is over. We just listened to the second talk by Maria Wheatley. It's been very interesting. Now, she didn't actually say as much as I would have liked about the Star Child Skull 2. She just mentioned that it's an ongoing research project of her. Bless you. <coughs> an ongoing research project of hers. Uh, but she did mention that she talked a lot, a lot about the, the beings, these creatures, these long-skulled people, because it appears there were different kinds of people um, living in, all, all across the world, all across the world, um, in the basically right up to maybe the fourth or fifth millennium BC. Now these were shorter than than round skull people. Round skull people being ourselves. And um, they, they had long, distinctly shaped heads. They were roughly a few inches shorter. Now, she talks about um, various barrows. Now, there's one particular barrow, which is actually, I can't remember what it's called. It's on Salisbury Plain near Stonehenge, and it's in the defence training estate. It's only actually open for some of the year round. And it, it, I can't help wondering, there's, there's so many interesting things in that area. That they've, the, the, the Ministry of Defence may have acquisitioned the entire location just to cover up these secrets. You can't even get, Maria's had to get special permission to visit some of these locations. And they put a fence around one of them, apparently, you're supposed to keep off badgers. Um, funny enough, they, the long skull people built long mounds and the round skull people built round mounds. And there's, there's even like a real big body in situ she found she thinks is a hybrid. Um, it has a little tail as well. Um, well, I do, yeah, and tails are quite rare. I mean, like, has a short appendage on the on the end of its spine, which is what a tail is. Of course, lots of animals have these extensions to their spine. Um, some, including some primates, the monkeys, but uh, humans lost it along with all the other apes. Now, she, there's a book she never mentioned, but I'm, she's familiar with it. Richard Thompson and Michael Cremo's Forbidden Archaeology, a huge book, about a thousand pages. It's well worth reading. Um, there's also signs that there may have been some kind of genocide. I mean, there certainly was a battle in the West Country around that time where lots of people were killed. Some it looks like were executed. One guy appears to be shot with a number of arrows. And he appears to be a hybrid. Um, and of course, then Maria brings up the long-headed statues of Egypt. You come, you come forward like a couple of thousand years and you're in the ancient Egyptian culture. And there are... Of course, for statues like, for example, Queen Nefertiti, who is um, look has a very unusually shaped head according to a statue. Lots of Egyptians have those heads. You could put it down to you could put it down to um, artistic license, but I think maybe there's another explanation. So anyway, this is the end. I'm um, just to give you a look. Everyone's trooping out after the first day. Matthew over there is quickly uh, packing everything up, and we're going to be back tomorrow. He's he's packing everything up for a little. He's sort of like. Doing something you fiddling up. That's you know, the best compliment I've had about all day. I'm packing. <laughs> <laughs> Only for you, Matthew. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're all back tomorrow, uh, including myself. I'll be doing my talk. I'm going to have to leave a bit early actually, because I've got to get back to Miles's place and prepare for my talk tomorrow. I want it to be a good one. So, uh, so let's try and find some way to get some way to get back to the devices. So, see you later. Colin and I are in the barge. Now, last time you saw us, there was, the barge was shut and there was just a kiosk. But we're having a pint here. Here in the front. Are you, do, you have, do you have a good day, Colin? Yeah, I had a good day. Yes. Tiny. Hey, there you go. It's, I don't believe it. <laughs> just when we start, just, I've just started filming. Look who's turned up. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's, it's Sir Tony it's of Toppingshire. Tony of Toppingshire. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. How are you? It's yeah. the man himself. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you, I just have to just start and do a little video, and you yeah. turn up. I know. Good to see you, old son. How are you? That's up, man. Hello, Say hello good evening. Family, hello, TV viewers. hello. Are we both talking tomorrow or are you on Sunday? I'm on four o'clock, mate, tomorrow. All right, just I'm after me. Right. Right. It's crazy stuff, yeah. but we're touching on some of the Russian the Russian uh, psychic warfare programme that not a lot of people know about. Right. Led by an amazing man called Alexei Savin. He's like the mm. Russian version of Ingo Swan. Oh, wow. And if, and if people don't know who Ingo Swan was, oh, yeah, he exactly. was the founder of Project Stargate, mm. kind of. So then, his book, what's, what's the title of his book? Oh, it's really good. He did, he did many. He yeah. had a really, really good book. He, he did Swan. many. He did yeah. one about the moon, didn't he? He yeah. did one about the moon. Penetration. Pen penetration. Yeah. He knows his stuff, doesn't yeah. Penetration. Very yeah, good book. Absolutely right. Yeah. Very good book. Yeah. And that, I is think about, that is about UFOs. Yeah, stuff, yeah, that's it. That's not some sick. Yeah, yeah. Your mind is disgusting. 
So, well, I know you two guys, I've seen me speak many times, so I'm hoping tomorrow's going to be a di di different, and I hope you'll turn around to me tomorrow and go, Tony, that was really different, thank you. I'm hoping, you know, because you're a barometer. You know. No, you know, uh, it'll, be, it'll be fun. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm actually getting bad head off, actually, because I'm going to go back and uh, right, re rehearse. I'm staying at Miles' place, oh, right. so I, I'm going to go back there and just so spend the just evening rehearsing. So I'm, I'm going with Colin oh, in a minute, right. yeah. Here. Mark's staying at the campsite uh, here. But I've got to, I want to get mine perfect, I want to get my talk perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah. It's my first one live yeah, yeah. for 18 months. Last time yeah. Raw Cun Hull was the last time I did yeah. a live talk. Yeah, yeah. February, February last year. Since then, yeah. it's been Skype calls, which is not the same. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm a bit out of practice. Yeah, right. um, right. you know. what you talk, what you talk it's going to be. What's going to happen next? Right. I'm going to be offering some perspectives on um, just basically the world as it is now and how it might go. It's also it is speculative, but I think I'm making intelligent guesses about what might happen in the next couple of years. And I'm going to be enlightening, hopefully enlightening, the uh, the audience with that tomorrow. Hello guys, yeah, it's uh, now quarter to ten in the evening, almost dark outside. I'm at the Basis Project headquarters, as you can see, you, recognize, you may recognise the famous Basis Satie I'm on. Um, this is my laptop, my new one, it is working, I'm glad to say. Um, I am currently go going over, doing a bit more rehearsal for my talk. I feel a bit nervous, actually. Um, more nervous than usual when I'm preparing for a talk. I think because it's literally been 18 months since I did all my last live talk. My last live talk was February the... It was February last year, so as you know, raw can't yeah, I've already talked about that. Um, the others have gone out for dinner. I didn't want to join them. I, I don't have time. I'm going to do this. So I've, I tried to order a pizza. They, they won't accept bloody cash. Bastards. So I just had a, I've had a couple of slices of bread. I've not eaten much. Um, I'll, be right. I'll make up for it tomorrow. But uh, I feel a bit on edge about this. I want to do a good job. This is a new presentation. I've not done it before. Um, the audience, I'm quite sure, will be very supportive. But I'm just feeling on. I'm feeling a bit uptight right now. Um, and I'm sure I feel I'll feel much better when I've done it. When it's all over. I feel a hell of a lot better, I think. Anyway, guys, um, I'm on my own in the house right now. Like I say, the others have all gone out. Uh, maybe I'll have a chance. Maybe I'll be able to find somebody to get hold of some food later, if not. I'll manage. Oh, I've had enough. Anyway. Oh, it's, I'm getting, I'll make sure I won't go to bed. I will not be going to bed late tonight. I will definitely not. I need a really, really good long night's sleep, I think. Yeah, and lots of revision, good night's sleep. Then the die is cast. I'll do the best I can, but I, no one can say I haven't skimped on the effort to try and do as good a job as I can. That's all I can say. So, night everyone. See you tomorrow.